clearly it's a word you need to do some digging on. Um, should I play the music?
live. Oh, there we are. Sorry, my audio wasn't coming through. So hopefully you heard it. We're here. We're live. You have it. Breakthrough news means morning news. United here. Election night 2022. I am one of your hosts, Eugene Perrier, here alongside Sam Sachs. Sam, happy to be with you. Back doing live election coverage with my friend Eugene Purrier. This is actually a reunion of the team that did live 2016 coverage, which uh, we all know how that worked out. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, we have returned. First is tragedy, now is farce. I'm expecting a lot of farce tonight, Eugene. Yeah, well, I, I think you were undoubtedly right about that, Sam, but at least we have a great show and a great lineup of people to break down. Whatever happens for you, we're sure going to have do. people from all different parts of the map, different struggles, different backgrounds, journalists, activists, people who are, are working on policy, really everything you could possibly imagine from now. That's 7.03 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern time. We will be here breaking everything down. We're going to have live uh, analysis, of course, but we're also going to be continually bringing you updates as it concerns what's happening both at the top of the ticket, at the bottom of the ticket, and somewhere in the middle. So we have you covered here. Breakthrough News means TV. We've absolutely got you covered on everything you need, election night related, 7 to 10. We are live on YouTube. We are live on Facebook, and we are live on Means TV. And if you don't know what that means, definitely check out means.tv and think about, I would strongly encourage you to become a subscriber, but we are live on multiple platforms together and united. But there is a lot at stake here. Obviously, Sam, I mean, the elections aren't everything, but they are something. And I think whatever happens here tomorrow, there's going to be some level of repercussions, especially for working class people. But maybe just give me some of your general general thoughts going into tonight as we have some of the early polls just starting to close as we get started here on the stream. Sure. I mean, these sorts of nights are always a little uh, weird for people like us with radical politics, like a lot of our viewers have. Um, there's a healthy dose of skepticism toward electoralism. Uh, you know, maybe I shouldn't speak on your behalf, Eugene, who's been a uh, on the ticket, a vice presidential candidate, a nominee for vice president of the United States. But uh, <laughs> some more than others, I should say, at least. Um, you know, I don't see how the uh, events unfolding tonight are going to move us any closer or any further away from building any sort of worker state. I mean, that work is being done uh, every other day of the year, especially in the wave of union organizing that we've been seeing around the country. In fact, that's happening today. There was just a big uh, Starbucks Workers United victory uh, in Virginia. So that's where the, the real action is happening uh, for uh like-minded individuals uh, like us. So um, having said that, though, the midterm elections are still uh, newsworthy. They're mm -hmm. still big news, and we do the news, so that's why we're here. And as you said, there are material consequences to this election for millions of people, uh, billions if you consider setbacks to whatever semblance of a clean energy policy that's been crafted over the last two years. So it is worth trying to identify and analyze these various political forces that are uh, expressing themselves within this election, both the revanchist nationalist right and this sort of liberal professional class, two factions that are largely backed by capital. And then you have the, the pockets of resistance to them both that we hope to uh, be covering tonight. Um, to me, there's both a sense of doom and of total absurdity. I mean, the control of the U.S. Senate could come down to whether or not voters elect Dr. Oz or Herschel Walker, guys who've been catapulted from their previous lives to be leaders of this new reactionary movement. And um, if Republicans do win the House and Senate, it'll be a political disaster for Democrats, one partially of their own making. Um, it'll also be a lot of pain for people. You can say goodbye to whatever climate investments were made by the Inflation uh, Reduction Act. They'll be sabotaged. Say hello to government shutdowns, hello to cuts to Social Security and Medicare. I mean, we know that Biden is a president who would relish making a West Wing style grand bargain with the Republican Congress to slash these programs. So um, a big hello to more police funding, which Democrats have already been doing, despite being cast as defunders of the police. Um, expect a lot more militarization of the border and deportations. You heard Kevin McCarthy, who would be House Speaker if Republicans take the majority in 
in the House talk about the first bill they're going to pass is more border security. And uh, the Biden administration hasn't done much to roll back a lot of the uh, added security that was put in place by the Trump administration when it comes to the border. And I say security, I should say oppression and human rights abuses. Um, expect more uh, incitement and violence against transgender folks who uh, uh, we've seen uh, this used as uh, an election uh, device to whip up support uh, by the right, but uh, it'll continue. You'll see all this legislation that we've seen at the state level uh, be put forward as messaging bills by Republicans in Congress. And then perhaps the biggest consequence, at least politically, is the effect this will have on the 2024 election. A Republican Congress will basically ensure that a Republican wins it. You know, not having a majority in Congress was the only thing that prevented Republicans from overturning the 2020 contest. It didn't have uh, anything to do with the strength of our institutions or whatever. It was just sheer numbers in Congress. So heading into 2024, fair to say that uh, if Republicans keep the majority, Trump's probably going to be the next president. And uh, so in many ways, Democrats have failed to use their majority over the last two years to preserve their access to power, not just by abandoning the working class, but also uh, not passing uh, a bill to strengthen elections to preserve uh, free and fair elections because we they couldn't disrupt the filibuster. So that's what it looks like, I think, if Republicans take control. I mean, on the plus side, you'll get a lot more information about Hunter Biden's party <laughs> lifestyle. Yeah. Um, might get a, a, the, the Benghazi investigation might be revived. Um, all very bad stuff. And then if you look, well, what if Democrats hang on and are able to preserve their narrow, narrow majorities tonight? Well, probably not much. I don't know what happens then because the last two years have been pretty uninspiring. Party uh, surprisingly not facing any consequences over its mishandling of COVID. That's not even an issue in this election, which is pretty astonishing as thousands are still dying every week. So uh, look, if the Democrats are able to keep the majority and which, which would be beneficial given how awful it would be if Republicans take over, it's hard to expect Democrats to do anything that would prevent another disaster looming in 2024 when you've got the big old fascist on the ballot. You know, expect Donald Trump to announce his candidacy for 2024, maybe even tonight, once it becomes clear Republicans are having a good night. So yeah, pretty low expectations tonight, but waiting, waiting to be surprised, Eugene. What, what are you looking at? Well, I'll tell you what, I'll be happy to be surprised. Well, that's actually not true. I shouldn't say that. We we were indeed surprised in 2016, and I was not happy about that. But no, I think you summed it up very well, Sam. I mean, it really feels that essentially, you know, what's going to happen tonight is either a maintenance, and this, I think for the Democrats, the best case scenario, a maintenance of the status quo, which is obviously a shambles, or something worse than the status quo at the same time where the democratic space is really shrinking. I, I mean, it, you know, it's one of the sort of odd realities, I think, about our society, how sort of undemocratic it is that I think is always on display in these election nights is, you know, on a sort of issue by issue basis, the country is not really moving to the right in any appreciable way when you just look at raw majorities or whatever it may be. But in such a highly gerrymandered atmosphere with, you know, so many other obstacles that exist to voting, to the anti-democratic nature of things like the Senate in and of themselves, the fact that we have nothing like majority rule in a real sense in the country narrows down the entire discussion to a handful of, I would argue, a relatively deeply unrepresentative districts when it comes down to, you know, the broader demographics of the country. And this is the lowest number of competitive House districts that there have ever been. I think 34 that are true toss-ups. I think it was like 52, I think, in 2020. So we're seeing, you know, the way the, the shrinking of the democratic space, the structural sort of undemocratic realities that have been with us since 1787, you know, plays such a huge role in, in not just narrowing what's possible, but in essentially really short-circuiting the idea of majority rule. And it's amazing to me that the Republicans could in fact take back potentially at least one house or both houses when almost each of their issues on a one-to-one -one basis is a minority position. And I think that also speaks to why they want to restrict the right to vote. So to me, this is really, this election is all about, and I think as you you said, Sam, sort of the, the work of moving the country in a more pro-working class direction 
probably is going to happen a lot less at the 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 in the election cycles the next few as it is on the streets in the workplaces in the neighborhoods and this election is really going to determine what's the framing what's the framework you know what's the context in which these things will will be taking place i mean obviously you see the this year well at least half in august i don't know where it has ended up now you know more union victories in 2022 than you know in over a decade and that wasn't just starbucks actually and we can talk more about that as we move on so when you talk about context it's going to come from a are we going to be in a context where there's going to be people who won't really do much of anything for labor but at least will speak positively about the role of labor unions or people who are going to go out of their way to pass bills in Congress to take, you know, to, to take rights away from workers, from organized workers. You know, the issue of Social Security you mentioned. I mean, amazing that Republicans, some Republicans thought that they were going to campaign on seniors going hungry, which is essentially, you know, what's on the table. So we've got the status quo, obviously a shambles. We've got what could be worse, which is the most likely change in the status quo. But who knows? You know, we'll see. And there's a lot of things that are out there to look for. I mean, obviously, even though in polling, many people are saying it's faded. There's the issue of a potential women's wave and what the the right to abortion being on the ballot in states like Michigan and California from a ballot perspective is going to do for turnout and all these different other factors that could overturn things. But I think really, and, and this is maybe my closing opening thought here on this point, is I feel this is an important moment for us to reflect on the structural defects of where we are, of the rightward shift in the country that's been happening steadily since 1970, well, let's I'll say 79 just to say it, but maybe a little bit earlier than that, um, is something that has not been arrested by the continued you know, lesser of two evil politics. And it's something that is continuing to take its toll as the challenges facing the country, facing the globe become even greater, but the opportunities on offer in the political system are so inadequate to meet the scale of the problems we face. And I think reflecting on, on those two things are, are really important for how we make change moving forward because it speaks to not only the context we're working in, but also truly what, if you don't have the options, how do you start to create the options for the things you want rather than just repeating what's been done for 30 or 40 years, Sam? Yeah, and those are all uh, themes that we we hope to explore with some of our guests tonight. And hopefully, uh, in addition to wallowing in all this, uh, try and find a way out of it uh, as well throughout the night. So uh, I guess we should start talking about some of the races that are going on. We have polls that have closed in Florida, Georgia, Indiana, Kentucky, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Virginia and uh, Vermont. Now, we are going to be keeping an eye on the five races that will determine control of the United States Senate tonight, and we're not going to get all the results uh, tonight, and we probably won't get them all for, for the few next few days, but um, all eyes are uh, on Georgia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Nevada, and New Hampshire. Uh, the problem for Democrats is they're playing defense in four out of five of those races. So all it would take is losing two for the party to lose their Senate majority here. And it makes Pennsylvania a key race. Uh, that's the one toss-up seat that Republicans are trying to defend after the retirement of Senator Pat Toomey. Polls close there in about an hour. Democratic Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman had a sizable lead over a uh, quack TV doctor <laughs> and... Uh, the New latest Jersey, in a long line of, uh, yeah, the latest in a long line of uh, Republican animal abusers, uh, Mehmet Oz. Uh, but that race has tightened up. It's also the most expensive political race in the country with over $133 million spent in it so far. It's also tight in Georgia where polls have now closed. Uh, we should be getting some numbers in from the uh, Georgia race soon. Uh, that race features incumbent Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock trying to fend off a far-right challenge from, of all people, Herschel Walker, uh, who's run a total mess of a campaign dealing with claims of prior domestic abuse and uh, incidents where he paid for an abortion, which is fine, except uh, he's been running a campaign to outlaw all abortions. Uh, despite that, no one in the Republican Party has abandoned the Walker campaign. Nikki Haley was just there campaigning for him this week, yes. and he's now just a, a coin flip away from being a United States senator. And uh, not great <laughs> for Democrats weird. that uh, yeah, that New Hampshire is now a toss-up state, the seat currently held by Maggie Hassan, 
Uh, but she faces a test from retired General Don uh, Bolduck. Guess that's his name, Bolduck. I'm I'm known for mispronouncing names uh, for Means Morning News, so I'm going to do it tonight too. Uh, Bulldog has a pretty serious case of conservative brain worms. He's warned that Bill Gates was using the COVID vaccine to microchip people. Uh, also has advanced the totally debunked claim that teachers are letting students identify as cats in school. I'm sure you've uh, heard this one, Eugene, mm. uh, that teachers are letting uh, their students use litter boxes. Um, wow. Later, later tonight, we're going to get results from Nevada, where incumbent Democratic Senator Catherine Cortez Masto has fallen behind in polling the Republican Adam Laxalt, one of those guys in Nevada who tried to overturn the results of the 2020 election. Also one of the guys claiming that they're running against, quote, woke corporations, mm. uh, which are not the corporations that are funding his campaign, but uh, the woke ones. Uh, <laughs> those are the ones that he's running The bad ones, yeah. Yeah. And wow. uh, in Arizona... Peter Thiel's tool, Blake Masters, is trying to knock off Democratic incumbent and astronaut Mark Kelly, uh, who's made it hard on himself by being one of the lone Democrats in the Senate holding up passage of the PRO Act, popular bill that would strengthen labor organizing in the country. Again, Democrats are playing on the defense here. They need to win four out of five to keep the uh, Senate majority unless they pull off a shock victory elsewhere. We will keep an eye on a few of those other races where Republicans have a seat that Democrats were hoping to flip, but have since lost ground heading into election day. Um, another Peter Thiel tool, the Hillbilly, Hillbilly Elegy writer, J.D. Vance. He's poised to keep a Senate seat in Ohio in Republican hands. Uh, that is unless Tim, please don't shout Ryan, can pull off an upset in that race. Uh, this is the fifth most expensive race in the country. Mm. And Peter Thiel has spent more on J.D. Vance's campaign than any person has ever spent on any Senate candidate ever. Wow. And uh, also you've got Ron Johnson from Wisconsin mm. expected to prevail against challenger Mandela Barnes. I've lost uh, all my friends and family because I can't stop saying Ron Johnson from Wisconsin <laughs> every time I see his name. Uh, finally, North Carolina, Ted Budd. Thank you. Poised uh, to keep an open Senate seat in Republican hands against Sherry Beasley. Uh, in the House, Republicans only need to pick up five seats to take the majority there. There's some key races uh, in Virginia. And you know what? I'm not the analyst tonight. We actually have an analyst here to help us get through tonight, Eugene. Yes. Uh, you know, on, on some of the cable news networks, SK stands for Steve Kornacki, but tonight, it stands for our election analyst, Steve, no uh, yeah, Sam Knight here, sequestered in an undisclosed location so that all the spin floating around won't influence his analysis of the returns. Uh, he's, he's lording over a team of quants that are reviewing the election data as it comes in over our servers. I think I have all that right. Sam Knight. What do you have your eye on? Welcome to the show. Good to have you. Now the team is officially reunited from 2016. Yes. Voltron. The boys are back in town. <laughs> well, it's uh, it's too early right now uh, to have any real take on the uh, houses in uh, that the races in Virginia that will be of consequence. Uh, the second, the seventh, and the tenth uh, congressional district. The seventh district is uh, currently held by Abigail Spanberger. Um, who you might recognize as the ex-CIA agent who always uh, goes on cable news to wag her finger at the left. Um, she was elected in 2018 with uh, several other uh, national security professionals, and they tried to brand themselves as a counterbalance to the squad. It never really caught on, although I personally tried to help them because I called them the death squad, um, still nothing. Uh, boy, they really tried to push that thing, didn't they? But anyway, uh, Spanberger is fighting for her seat tonight. Uh, it's expected to be a close race. It was a close race uh, last time in 2020, so um, not really a surprise there. One other race she, she that I'm... She a... Uh... An endorsement, didn't she, Spanberger, recently? That's right. She did, from uh, Liz Cheney. Um, mm. so August. She, 
she's got that going for her. Well, she wasn't the CIA, uh, so nice national security connection. That's right. Another race in the uh, states that w- with polls that close early that to look out for is the Indiana First Congressional District. That's held currently by uh, Frank Mervin. Um, that's M R V A N. Uh, a funny vowel to consonant ratio there. Um, this is a seat that has been held by Democrats since before the uh, stock market crash of 1929. So if this one flips, Indiana first, um, it was it was rated as a toss up by Real Clear Politics uh, in the run up to the election. If that one flips, uh, Democrats could be in for a long night. Um, one thing to Mervin, going down in the history books for an unfortunate, unfortunate news. Mr. Mervin, he, he, he might. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Um, another thing to look out for is, you know, patterns. For example, thirty states have passed laws uh, making it harder to vote since twenty twenty, uh, sort of fueling or, or giving credence to the right-wing conspiracy theories about the election being stolen from Trump in 2020 by um, some elaborate plot um, that they never really explained. Uh, There are new laws in Georgia, Texas, Florida, Iowa, Kansas, uh, all all enacting um, harsh penalties for things like uh, dropping off people's ballots, which is really affecting the uh, access to the ballot box for disabled people. Um, Georgia, of course, many of you probably remember the headlines uh, when this bill passed, uh, makes it a crime to hand out snacks to people who are in line uh, at polling places in in the state of Georgia. Uh, Ron DeSantis has basically established a a secret police, uh, well, it's not secret because he did it out in the open, um, basically yeah, the whole point uh, of it is to be very public <laughs> very, yes, to be a, a, a very, uh, indiscreet police force to go after alleged, uh, election crimes. And we saw high profile, uh, arrests in the run up to the vote that nothing actually came of them because obviously these people weren't doing anything wrong. Um, but you know, the message being, uh, we're going to try to intimidate you, uh, and, and to stop you from voting. Uh, there are several states, I should note, that have also made it easier to vote, believe it or not. And one of them is Nevada, where some of the um, some of the rules that uh, were enacted during the pandemic have uh, have st- have stayed on in this election. And it has actually ac- expanded access uh, to the ballot in Nevada and there, there are other states as well. Um, we'll have to keep a look out, see if there are any uh, patterns emerging there. There are uh, regional differences in inflation. Inflation is slightly worse in the Southeast and the Southwest in the Sun Belt. Um, we'll see if that has any impact on, uh, on how the vote turns out. And also, you know, we've been talking about climate the West has been, you know, under, a, first of all, it's been under a mega drought for two decades, but that has intensified uh, in the past two years or so. Will it have a, an impact? Probably not, but, you know, it's worth keeping an eye out for, for patterns. Also, the uh, the Midwest has been under a severe drought and um, all along the Mississippi Basin has has, has seen a, uh, a a severe lack of rainfall uh, in recent weeks. And who knows? I mean, climate is obviously on some voters' minds, on younger voters' minds. Uh, we obviously, it ranks uh, lower than issues like abortion and inflation this election, but something to keep an eye out for. Mm-hmm. Well, 
Sam, appreciate you as always. A lot to keep an eye out for, and I know that you are going to be there sequestered in the bunker with your team of highly trained professionals that you oversee, having trained them yourself, bringing us updates throughout the evening here. And again, we'll be here till about 10 p.m. Eastern tonight. We're going to be bringing you updates from all of the races. Of course, we'll be bringing you an analysis. We've got all sorts of guests. We are live on Means TV. We are live on the Breakthrough News YouTube. We are live on on both Facebook. So we are all over the internet. So take the opportunity to let everyone who is following you, let you, let Jesus Christ, who is following you know that we are here so that they can be following us. Obviously, I am uh, not campaigning here tonight, not on my top form. But yeah, no, it, there's a lot here. And, and you know, one thing, Sam, well, that's a weird thing to say because there's two Sams. Uh, <laughs> Sam Sachs, that I think is obviously, you know, the overriding conversation that has been existing, you know, for the past couple months is, and this happens every election, you know, the issue of the economy, the issue of inflation, of course, you know, the month of September, 8.2%. Uh, I think we'll actually get the numbers this Thursday for October. 8.2% um, increase in inflation year on year. So, Basically, things are 8% more expensive in September of 2022 than September of 2021. Food at home, 13%. So people are really getting hit at the grocery store in addition to the gas pump. And I think Sam was, Sam Knight, very correct to say in different parts of the country, these are, you know, it's exacerbated in different areas. And I, I think we might have a graphic here that speaks to this to some degree. I've seen multiple headlines like this. This one I think is from The Guardian, but there was also one in The Washington Post. Um, and maybe we could bring it up that I think speaks to the just the overall issue of how bad people have. And, and another thing, just to remind folks, there's over 150 million Americans who are struggling to meet their week-to-week -week expenses every single week. 152 million. So you look at that. Surviving inflation, one plasma donation at a time. It's from the Washington Post. One plasma donation at a time. People are being hit so hard by inflation, they're forcing... They're being forced to, to sell their own blood in order to eat. And that's what the story is about and other things and other expenses. So you got over 150 million people struggling to make it week to week. And many of them are being forced to sell their own blood. And I, I think that speaks to such a high degree to the, the, the pain that people are feeling. But the irony in some ways is, even though people are talking about inflation, neither party has a plan around inflation. I mean, the Democrats did pass an Inflation Reduction Act, which may reduce inflation by, you know, seven-tenths of a percent. The Republicans very sneakily are talking a lot about it, but they have no plan. Both parties have outsourced their plan to the Federal Reserve, whose plan is to just take a baseball bat to every working class person and beat us to death, essentially, by raising the interest rates to tank the economy, which will cool inflation, but it'll also throw a bunch of people out on the street. And quite frankly, for those of us who have debts, which is a lot of working class people, the increase in inflation up until that time is also killing us. So on the front end and on the back end, you know, big business is not bearing the brunt of this. And, and really, anyone who's watched the World Series, anyone who's watching college football, watching pro football knows that so many of the ads have actually been about crime, not about inflation. And uh, you know, it makes sense given that there's an overall reality where I don't think either party is speaking to it. But I did just want to play this brief supercut, if you will, of ads related to, to crime just to also set the scene for, for what this election has been and how it's been, been framed. And cash bail, putting violent criminals right back on the street. And votes release murderers over and over. John Fetterman. Helping killers kill again. The killers kill again. And that's, I mean, honestly, I don't know, Sam, if you watch any of the World Series or anything like that, but it was like every other ad was something like that, it seemed to me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, and you've, you've actually seen ads far worse than that, um, the, that people are, are just being inundated with. I mean, it's... It's downright political malpractice that Democrats have not been able to come up with a message around inflation that this is the cost of corporate profit seeking. Mm -hmm. that prices are so high right now because corporations are making record profits, that they have jacked up prices well above any increases in the cost of goods or labor so that they can enjoy world historic profits. Now, I say that that's malpractice on the part of Democrats, 
Um, but we know that who the party is actually trying to serve. So uh, they're doing what they should do, I guess. Yeah. Just to interject um, real quick, Sam, 51 cents of every dollar of inflation is profits. Exactly, exactly. And I don't think you hear maybe John Fetterman will talk about this occasionally. But other than that, you hardly hear any Democrats uh, running for office discussing this and only just a handful uh, in, in the House and Senate that are willing to tell the truth about inflation, which is this is simply just corporate profit seeking. And what the Fed is doing is crushing workers. Now, lucky uh, for Democrats, the, the pain that the Fed is planning to inflict probably won't be felt uh, by the brunt of people until after this election. Um, but you're already starting to see the, the headwinds in the economy and you're seeing responses uh, in these exit polls of people uh, um, who vote Republicans saying they're voting because of the economy, that they're supporting uh, Republicans. But uh, you brought up all these these ads, Eugene. This is the most uh, expensive midterm election in U.S. history, which uh, I suppose another way to look at it is it's the least expensive midterm election for the rest of your life. <laughs> um, spending on federal midterm elections is expected to top $9.3 billion dollars. Uh, outside spending uh, is going to be over uh, $2 billion. That's according to Open Secrets. Um, of that $2 billion in outside spending, like half of it is financed by a couple hundred billionaire families. It's the most they've ever spent in a midterm and the most outside groups have ever spent in one. Uh, there were a lot of problems with the outside in, outsized influence of the rich in our elections before the 2010 Supreme Court Citizens United decision just blew off all limits on individual spending. Since then, the oligarchs have just gone wild, though. Uh, top donors this year include George Soros and his uh, well-funded operation to elect Democrats, over $125 million spent on these midterms. Uh, it's well-funded, but that's about it. A lot of money sloshing around. Not sure how effective it is. Mm -hmm. uh, right behind Soros, you have the fiercely anti-union U-Lines who've spent more than $75 million. Other right-wing donors include Ken Griffin and Peter Thiel. Uh, and the only other liberal donor here is uh, crypto billionaire uh, Sam Bankman-Fried. Mm. Uh, Bad day for him. He's, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've heard it's a, it's a bad day. He is uh, in charge of FTX over there, and he's spent a fortune uh, trying to elect Democrats who are uh, friendly to uh, crypto regulations, but uh, should have preserved some of that money because I hear his exchange is uh, imploding. Um, one funny thing about this spending, this record-breaking amount of spending in our elections is just how much of it is being thrown into a bonfire. Uh, I mentioned how Pennsylvania is the most expensive race, period. Uh, the Senate race in Georgia is the second. Both of those are competitive races, at least. The third most expensive race is in Florida, and it's not expected to be competitive tonight. Democrats have spent a fortune trying to beat the often humiliated Marco Rubio. Over $69 million spent on what looks like a losing effort there. Mm. Not very nice. Uh, check out uh, the two most expensive house races in the country. The first one is Georgia's 14th district, which is home to uh, the, the CrossFit Christo fascist Marjorie Taylor Greene. Democrats have spent almost $15 million trying to defeat her, and they're likely to get blown out there. The second most expensive house race is California's 47th district, currently held by Democratic Congresswoman Katie Porter. Hmm. Um, She's not really a radical anti-capitalist or anything, but someone who has uh, made a few clips of herself go viral grilling CEOs and exposing some of the cruelties of the financial system toward working class people. And so outside groups have spent over $9 million trying to defeat her re-election campaign, yet she's expected to win tonight. Um, so money's still playing a huge influence, but in some cases, not enough to defeat a good candidate. 
No, I think that's the case. I mean, diminishing returns can set in. Uh, certainly, you know, the Obama campaign did a lot of research into that in 2008 and, you know, brought it into their 2012 campaign. It came out after that campaign. But that by far the most effective way to reach voters is knocking on a door. The least effective way is actually ads. But, I mean, you know, there's a whole economy around the sort of ad-driven piece that I think is kind of a hidden element of the money machine and how politics works is these media buyers and how they circle through the consulting agencies and the congressional offices and things like that, uh, the super PACs and the like. So, I mean, there's an economy to it that I think drives itself irregardless of some of the actual effects. And that it leads to these moments where people are just burning cash. There's also Charlie Crist uh, in Florida, too. Maybe they bought him a nice fan, um, do something like that. <laughs> I don't know if anyone got that. Charlie well, Chris does have a fan that everyone has. One thing I want to address real quick, we had um, someone I know on the Means TV stream, we're live on Means TV, asking about Maricopa County. There are some claims coming from former President Donald Trump and others of fraud there. Now, there was a report in the Washington Post that at one point earlier in the day, 20% of polling locations in Maricopa County, that's where Phoenix is for people who don't know, um, you know, we're quote unquote experiencing problems. But what's important about that is the problem was with the, um, uh, not the issue of casting the vote, but in those polling places themselves, could they actually count the vote? So it doesn't affect the end result. All it means is that any votes they are unsure of that were cast, they have a record of them being cast, are only tabulated at a central facility after the polls close. So along with early voting and mail-in ballots there in Arizona that are counted once the polls close, these other these 20% of polling places that had some problems will send all their votes there so they can be 100% sure. So that's certainly one of these early claims that's being made regarding the, the election issue, uh, the election so-called election fraud, which is not real. Uh, but already I think we can see how misinformation around the elections are going to be driving a lot of the narrative here tonight, I'm sure, Sam. Yeah, definitely uh, expect some funny business at some point throughout the night. Um, so we've talked about a lot of the uh, the Senate races, some of the House races, but we'll have the, the biggest impact on people's individual lives are the state ballot initiatives. Quite a few of them to keep an eye on throughout the night. First, we're seeing a surge in labor organizing around the country, but that hasn't really translated too much into activity at the ballot box. Just a pair of competing initiatives, Amendment 1 in Illinois, which would guarantee collective bargaining as a right under the state's constitution. On the other side, in Tennessee, their own Amendment 1 would do the opposite and enshrine in its constitution a uh, so-called right to work. Uh, we do have a few states that are considering minimum wage increases. Nebraska's Initiative 443 would raise it from $9 to $15 an hour by 2026. And Nevada's Question 2 would boost the minimum wage from $10.50 to $12 by 2024. And where I'm at in Washington, D.C., voters are considering Initiative 82, which would eliminate the tip minimum wage and ensure that all workers make the full minimum wage if it passes it would be the second time that D.C. residents voted mm -hmm. to ditch the tip minimum. Uh, they did so in 2018. Uh, I should say we did so in 2018. I remember voting in that. But uh, the D.C. City Council overruled us and kept it in place thanks to pressure from restaurateurs like celebrity chef Jose Andres. Andres. So voters are trying now again, hoping that a city council with more left-wing members this time doesn't ignore them. Abortion is also on the ballot following the Supreme Court's Dobbs decision over the summer. Uh, in reaction, voters in three states will consider a constitutional amendment that guarantees their right to reproductive health care, including abortions. That's in California, Michigan, and Vermont. In Kentucky, Amendment 2 would prohibit a constitutional right to an abortion. And voters in Montana are considering a measure that could allow for criminal charges to be brought against doctors who perform certain abortions. And uh, later tonight, we can all burn one down for the voters in the new states that legalize <laughs> marijuana. Uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, Arkansas, Maryland, and Missouri are considering le legalizing weed for recreational use. 19 states have already legalized smoking big doinks, add in these five, and that's nearly half the states in the dang country. Mm. Meanwhile, Colorado voters, as always, a couple steps ahead of everyone else on this, will consider Proposition 121, 
which will allow for the use of psilocybin. Magic mushrooms. I know SK will join me in scarfing one down for Colorado later. What about you, Eugene? Huh? Listen, this is huh? a family show, so you know I'm I I always stay clean, sober, and clean cut. But I'm very happy to see that there are so many voters around the country that are forward leaning uh, on getting rid of this ridiculous war on drugs, especially things like marijuana and mushrooms. That I mean, if you look at what's legal out here. I mean, cigarettes, sodas. I mean, it's like, you know all these things that are there you can buy in Seven Eleven are killing hundreds of thousands of people every year. I, I can't really speak for the numbers on mushrooms. I don't know who weed has ever killed. So very interesting. One interesting thing about that I'll also say too, I think if all these marijuana ballot measures win, that would add eight Republican senators in states that have legal marijuana. And we've seen in Colorado that you just mentioned, a bunch of Republicans have, you know, become much more pro-weed. Obviously, they want the donations from the business owners. They don't want irate weed smokers to vote against them and have become stronger voices for things like marijuana banking and others. So that's another kind of interesting wrinkle, even in Republicans, whether they take the Senate, is it possible there could be some progress around some issues like marijuana banking and others? Uh, you know, in many ways, it seems unlikely, but an interesting element of this. Well, I think it's time to bring in our first guest uh, of the evening who is also tracking uh, ballot measures across the country. Uh, we've got Rebecca Entralgo with us, the managing editor over at inequality.org. There she is. Hey, Rebecca. Hi. Welcome to our election special. What, so what are some of the most significant ballots? I, me I mentioned a few of them. Uh, I'm curious what you think are some of the more significant ones around the country besides, of course, uh, Colorado and their uh, Magic Mushrooms initiative. Yeah, I mean, one that I'm particularly excited about and I'm tracking tonight is in Massachusetts. It's called the Fair Share Amendment or also known as the Millionaire's Tax. It would levy a 4% tax on all individuals that have an annual income of a million dollars or more, um, of which there are over 20,000 in the state of uh Massachusetts, which is just mind boggling to think about. Um, and I mean, the good news is that it has an, you know, sort of overwhelming support in the in Massachusetts. I think one poll showed it had about you know 70% support. Um, but there are some opponents uh, of the tax, they claim that it'll force high earners out of the state. Um, but I think, you know, numbers are really clear that in states like California, which is already sort of a, a high tax state, um, that's really a non issue, the people who are actually being forced out of the state are low and middle income voters or, or low and middle income residents who um, are being pushed out by the affordability crisis. Um, so, you know, in fact, I think I think the numbers show between 2010 and 2019, the number of Californians who reported an income of a million dollars or more um, actually increased by over 100 um, mm. percent. So I don't really think that's uh, an issue to, to worry about there. Um, and I should have mentioned before that that tax uh, that uh, ballot uh, proposal in particular, um, the money that would be raised from that tax would be used to fund public education um, as well as transportation. So that's what I'm definitely paying attention to. Um, and I think sort of the caveat with all these sort of tax increases is that, you know, they're as good as tax enforcement is. So I think that's something to be, uh, to, you know, to keep in mind as well. Like I think, you know, our tax code is so complex and, um, and just, really favors uh, people who have access to really, you know, crafty lawyer, uh, you know, tax lawyers who can, you know, really uh, get at hiding the wealth in, in ways that won't get taxed. So I think that's, you know, as always a caveat with that type of stuff, but that's what I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing what happens there. Um, and similarly, you know, there is Cal, uh, California, speaking of California, Prop 30, which is kind of uh, controversial. Um, I know they have a tax on the, or, uh, something on the ballot now that would add a surtax of, I think it was about 1.75% on people making more than $2 million a year. And the way it's being framed now is that it will uh, sort of fund wildlife prevention and expand access to electric vehicle programs. Um, but it's also worth mentioning that some people view this uh, particular proposal as a kickback to Lyft, which despite laying off over 700 employees uh, recently, spent over $50 million to support this proposition. Mm. Um, so for that 50 million, the company could have given 6,000 Lyft drivers an $8,000 subsidy to purchase electric vehicles. So that's just something to keep in mind with that. But I thought that was really interesting when looking at these two uh, proposals to tax the wealthy. And those are really the only way you can tax the wealthy nowadays, it yeah. seems, with Democrats being so uh, politically afraid 
of proposing any tax increases. I see they're getting knocked in exit polls uh, for raising taxes, even though they didn't. Like they really haven't raised uh, any significant amount of taxes on the rich, but they're still getting criticized for it. Uh, at the state level, it's an even worse situation over decades of, of them running on tax cuts that have starved states of revenue that like the only way you can actually try and get some more revenue from the wealthy is through these ballot initiatives, through this kind of quote unquote direct democracy process that's happening. Yeah, and I, I think what I find so interesting about ballot initiatives and ballot referendums is that it really just shows what voters are actually interested in and sort of, they can tell us a lot about what they're interested in aside from voting for Republican or voting for Democrat. It's sort of how you sort of got that viral meme that came out of um, the last midterm election actually in 2018 when, um, you know, Florida voters overwhelmingly voted for increasing the minimum wage and legalizing medical marijuana, but also that was the first elect election they voted in uh, Ron Santos. So, you know, I think that's kind of um, really interesting to keep an eye out for tonight. Um, and, you know, I, I, and I think it's also just shows that there are ways that we can create really interesting and progressive tax systems, really interesting and progressive, uh, you know, policy proposals on the local and state level that can be modeled out, um, you know, to the federal level. Like, I think, you know, if the election tonight goes as predicted, there's going to be a lot of gridlock on the federal level, and it's going to be really frustrating to get anything passed. And I think that, you know, passing things on the state and local level and showing that these programs actually really work is going to be really crucial um, whenever there is a, you know, progressive majority in, in Congress on the federal level. And that's why, yeah, I've just been tracking a lot of these like really niche local <laughs> initiatives, like one in Portland, Maine, um, that is being led by the local DSA chapter there. Um, they have three questions on the ballot today. Um, one will address the growth of Airbnbs there um, and sort of um, limit uh, the use of, uh, you know, single unit housings for Airbnbs. And I think they estimate that will return about 315 housing units back to the long term rental market, which is really great. They have another question on the ballot, which will strengthen protections for tenants um, and make sure they release uh, they receive at least 90 days notice for lease terminations. Um, and I think the last question on the ballot would, similar to DC, they have a, you know, eliminating the tip minimum wage on the ballot there in Portland, Maine. And um, not only would that eliminate the tipped wage, but it would increase the local hourly minimum wage to $18 an hour um, and also extend that minimum wage protection to uh, gig economy workers like rideshare drivers, delivery drivers, personal shoppers, et cetera. So I think that's probably one of the widest ranging minimum wage increases um, in the country right now is actually in the city of Portland, Maine. So, you know, I think this is really crucial to keep track of across the country, especially, you know, I was, when I was doing some research into this, I think a lot of people don't necessarily don't necessarily think of cities like Portland, Maine, when I think about the affordability crisis. But, you know, when I was looking this up, it's the annual income needed to afford a medium priced home in Portland has doubled over the past decade to about $130,000 a year. Um, and the medium household income there is just under $62,000 um, a year. So I think, you know, keeping track of these things across the country is going to be really crucial going forward if we're wanting to sort of uh, really duplicate these efforts on a federal level. No, it's an extraordinarily important point. And I, I mean, there's so much about it. I mean, it just even how you shape issues. I mean, I think the the in Florida the last time the issue of felons voting got like 70 percent, which was, I think, like 10 or 15 percent ahead of Ron DeSantis. So, you know, it's interesting to see how you might be able to frame things differently. It could shift politics in a big way. And, you know, I, I really appreciate you you following all these, Rebecca. And I guess the thing that it kind of makes me reflect the most on is 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 why is it a niche thing to follow this? I mean, I don't want to rip MSNBC or anyone else who's on, but I feel, you know, it's sort of the last thing you hear about at 10 o'clock at night or right before a commercial break that there are these ballot measures. But I mean, these seem so deeply consequential. So I wonder what, you know, that says to you in terms of how the media environment often shapes how, how we view our politics. Yeah, I mean, I think that's sort of a question I always ask myself sort of every election cycle, like this is what's actually really most interesting to me. But, um, you know, I think, you know, maybe within, within a case like Portland, Maine, it is sort of, I guess, like a smaller town in the grand scheme of things. But, you know, I think that's I think there are lessons to be learned in all of these really local and, and state races. Um, and also, I think people there's no there's no horse race. Right. CNN mm -hmm. is not really interested in in. Um, in in talking to people who have really complex views about these things, right? They're sort of interested in just keeping things really partisan. Um, and I think the average voter has, um, as reflected in the results of 
all these memes and initiatives. Um, you know, the average voter is multifaceted. They have conflicting views, and that doesn't really fit into the narrative that a lot of mainstream media uh, really likes to perpetuate. Um, you know, Democrat voters think X, Y, Z. Republican voters think X, Y, Z. Black voters think X, Y, Z. Latino voters think X, Y, Z. So I feel like people are really interested in putting certain voters into boxes. Um, and I think you know, analyzing things through the lens of a two-party system is probably the easiest way to get people interested. And, um, you know, I think, you know, state and local races, while they are probably the most important, um, unfortunately, like, don't get much attention. And I was actually um, going to my local wine store before um, hopping on oh, and uh, I was... <laughs> I was talking with the woman working in the cashier there and she saw I had an I voted sticker and she was just like, you know, people are really concerned about, you know, who's going to win in which Senate race. But, you know, I'm more interested. She lives in Montgomery County, Maryland. She's like, I'm more interested in like who's being elected to like school board or, you know, a lot of these local races. She said, you know, was explained to me that has the biggest impact on her. And I really think that's the case. Um but you know, those just don't, don't, they don't really uh, produce the same flashy headlines um, as, you know. Betterman or Oz or, you know, any of sort of the big ticket races tonight. Mm -hmm. Well, Rebecca, we can take the hint. We'll let you get back to your bottle of wine for the rest of the night and watch the uh, <laughs> results roll in. Uh, and we'll keep an eye on a lot of those ballot initiatives you mentioned uh, throughout the evening. Rebecca Entralgo from inequality.org. You can follow her on Twitter. Thanks for uh, stopping by. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, well, you know, uh, Sam, one of the things that was happening out there and that we were talking about at the top is, you know, what were challenges going to be with people voting seems all across social yeah. media. People are starting to share their own stories of challenges they've had voting. This is one we want to play here from Harris County, Texas, where it seems that people, you know, were waiting long lines, not able to vote, ultimately going different places. But anyway, I'll, I'll um, let this woman tell her own story. Her own story. So I'm at my second polling location. This is Sunnyside Community Park. Um, the machines are down. There's a flyer telling people that they can catch the bus to these locations to vote. People are catching the bus. People gotta go to work. It's now 9, 18, Harris County, Houston, Texas, Sunnyside two locations the machines are down so i'm not crying anymore i probably will when i stop this video we need to do better i guess we do better by voting right and i guess that's the point come on harris county wow so yeah i mean Honestly, sadly, Sam, this is actually not that rare. This is a long-going issue in Harris County. Lat 2020 election, there's a Texas State University, people waiting for like five or six hours. And it speaks very much to these structural issues we've been talking about, which is that localities are, are starved of election funds, right? They're not really given enough funds. And oftentimes it happens place like Harris County. That's where Houston is. You know, Cleveland, this is a huge thing. Back in 2004 elections, you probably remember um, the issue of the long lines there where they have older machines, not as many machines, and one thing breaks down or whatever, and, and everything can, can, can fall apart. But the dominoes here, Sam, you know, I think around all these different issues around voter suppression and ability to vote is going to be a big one here in this election. And a lot of people saying we may not even really know until tomorrow or the next day because of so many things that are out there happening, lawsuits and the like. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, this is deliberate what's happening here. It's a deliberate choice to uh, cut the voting infrastructure in areas that uh, uh, where the population doesn't support your cause. So, you know, it's not just, you hear about get out the vote in elections, but that's just like part of the struggle mm -hmm. is getting out the vote. You also have to make sure that the infrastructure exists to take the vote for your supporters. You have to then make sure you can get your supporters out to vote. And then after that, you have to make sure that their votes get counted. I know that there's reports of thousands of ballots in Pennsylvania that are at risk of not being uh, counted in, in a Senate race that's extremely close, like Fetterman versus Oz, that could uh, make a huge difference. And 
you know, you've heard so much about the, you know, Sam Knight brought up the, the, the voter fraud task force down in Florida that DeSantis has set up just this complete sham police force that, uh, hit, you know, more than 20 people with these bogus charges of, of voter fraud. All of that is meant, um, not to just sow doubt in the election should Republicans lose, but also to cover up for the actual voter suppression that they are doing that they've been long doing since the beginning of this country, really. So mm -hmm. um, you're seeing it play out in every single election, and it's it's a result of deliberate choices being made. And also the other part of it is a terrible infrastructure. The fact that we don't have a unified voting system in this country. Every local area has their own system, and it can go wrong in their own unique way. And it just creates a giant mess. And well, it's it, it's uh we're we're sort of a mockery of the developed world and how we and how we run our elections. No, I think that's one hundred percent true. I mean, even you know, just uh, the what the young woman mentioned there in her video. I mean, people got to go to work. Obviously, in a lot of countries, an election is a holiday. Uh, you know, and you mentioned infrastructure, also public transportation. You know, I was in Mexico City in 2018 um, for the presidential election there. And on election day in Mexico City, it was for the whole country of Mexico. But um, the subway is free. It's totally free all day. So everyone, you know, can get to get to vote more easily, won't have to take a financial hit to get to their polling place, can travel more easily between their job and their polling place. But, you know, there's obviously a big focus that is put on the issue of making it easy for people to vote. And, you know, of course, D.C., New York, San Francisco, Chicago, maybe that's on the table, but we barely even have public transportation anywhere. But, you know, you think anywhere with a bus system, you would have free buses. You would think you'd have giving people day off, the day off. I, I saw this. I cannot confirm this 100 percent, but I did see people talking about this earlier, labor activists. So just I'm just telling you that this is unconfirmed. But I heard that REI was giving over, giving two hours for people to vote for everyone who worked there, except for the two stores that unionized recently, uh, <laughs> one of which is in New York. So they did not get the two hours off to vote, but everyone else did. So, I mean, it just gives you a sense of how, you know, shambolic the whole thing really is on, on so many, so many different levels and, Ugh. Well, it sounds like a, another labor law violation has to be filed against uh, REI. Yeah. Someone <laughs> get on that right now. So we're coming up on 8 p.m. A lot of polls closing at 8 p.m. We're going to bring back Sam Knight here in just a second to get some updates on some of the races. At the 8 p.m. hour, we've got polls closing in Alabama, Delaware, Connecticut, Florida, Illinois, Kansas, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, Mississippi, New Jersey, New Hampshire, North Dakota, Ooh. Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island. South Dakota, Tennessee, Texas, and right here in Washington, D.C. So that is uh, a lot of uh, important races, a lot of the toss-up Senate races uh, in, in uh, uh, Pennsylvania and here in Georgia, which we're uh, monitoring. Uh, is, is, uh, is Sam Knight ready? Is, is he ready to come on here? There he is. There he is. Sam Knight, uh, what, what updates do you have for us here? <clears throat> well, it's still early, obviously, but... Uh votes are starting to come in in some key Senate races. Uh, Raphael Warnock has a healthy lead with 23% of the vote in. He's up uh, 17 percentage points on mm. Herschel Walker, which is uh, nothing to uh, dismiss uh, with a quarter of the vote in. We have Sherry Beasley up on Ted Budd in North Carolina with about a little over a third of the vote in. She's up by 11 percentage points. Very early in Ohio, but uh, Tim Ryan out uh, to an early lead on J.D. Vance. Probably not even worth mentioning the uh, size of the lead because, again, it's very early, about 6% of the vote in. House Democrats not doing so well in Virginia. Elaine Luria down in Virginia's second. Spanberger also down. Um, nothing called yet. Speaking of races that have been called, uh, Sam Sachs, I know you mentioned how much money uh, Democrats lit on fire trying to unseat Marjorie Taylor Greene. Well, Decision Desk called it for Greene pretty much at like mm. seven oh five or something like that, like within <laughs> within minutes. So, uh, but it was a very successful 
campaign for all the Democratic Party consultants who just seem to live off of failure as long as they can raise yes. money from rich people and give it to uh, candidates who have no appeal uh, to anyone, but you know, they, they can still keep it going every two years. You know, you gotta, you gotta run someone in those seats. You gotta contest in every, uh, congressional district. You don't need to spend, uh, record amounts in every congressional district. Nevertheless, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene looks like she is hanging on and not worried about the challenger at all, whose name I didn't even bother to learn and neither should you. Yeah. <laughs> too late for him now. Not too late for Sam Knight, who's going to be up with us all night till 10 p.m. looking at every race. I mean, I have to say the one you pointed out that really strikes me the most interesting is North Carolina, Sam. Sherry Beasley, who at one point was the chief justice of the state Supreme Court of North Carolina, uh, I think she was someone died or something like that, and she got elevated in, I think, an election, a special election. But nevertheless, she lost the like next full election after she served, but it was by, I think, like 400 votes. It was like 5 million votes cast. I think the mm. guy who won is like 2.9 million votes. She had like 2.5 million votes. So super razor thin there in North Carolina. And I don't know if anyone has ever seen Ted Budd do anything, but I have to say he's the <laughs> least <laughs> impressive. I saw when he got announced by Trump at the North Carolina GOP meeting where the whole big deal was how Lara Trump wasn't going to run. Like everyone was like, oh, she might run. And she gets up. She doesn't run. He calls up Ted Budd. And no lie, the guy just giving like a two minute, maybe not even two minutes, maybe like a minute and 30 second stump speech. And he was reading it um, off of a cue card. And I just thought if you can't give like a rousing minute and a half speech to like the North Carolina GOP convention, nighttime event where everyone's liquored up, then I have to be thinking you might not be the best candidate. I'm Ted Budd. <laughs> well, uh, it is, uh, I guess, interesting that Democrats seem to be playing defense in a lot of these races that they absolutely need to play defense in, but uh, of course still uh, very early, and we will continue to be getting results uh, throughout the night. Yeah, we certainly will. And as you said, we're looking at a lot of places that have just closed, interesting things that are happening, uh, and many of them, some of them you can look and see that they're so uncontested they're already being called, which says something, again, about the way things are structured. Yeah. But, you know, I think that when we talk about the structural issues, the structural challenges that exist, you know, in the context of, of the U.S. elections, one thing that's always important for me to mention, and I'll mention it as we get ready to introduce our next guest, is the number of people who are former felons, I hate to even use that that nomenclature, those who are formerly incarcerated, 4.6 million people disenfranchised due to a conviction. 4.6 million people. The good news is that's 24% below where it was in 2016, so over 5 million people. But nevertheless, uh, way over, say, 1976, just want to get this right, there was 1.2 million people disenfranchised, 96, 3.3 million. So the impact of mass incarceration over time and driving up the number of people who can't vote. Florida, also, by the way, number one state, despite that ballot measure, one in 19 black Americans of voting age is disenfranchised. It's three and a half of, of uh, non-African Americans, one in every 19. And in Alabama, Arizona, Florida, Kentucky, Mississippi, South Dakota, Tennessee, and Virginia, more than one in 10 black adults are disenfranchised because of a felony conviction. So when you look at it in that framework, it really speaks very heavily to the challenges, I think, in no matter how hard you vote, getting things done. Obviously, 20 million roughly undocumented people as well. And on that note, to talk a little bit about this and much more, very happy to be joined as we continue our breakthrough news means morning news election night 2022 live stream by Claudia De La Cruz, the co-executive director of the People's Forum, cultural worker, community organizer, ordained reverend. I mean, I could go on and on. The show would be over by the time I got to the end of the list of your superlatives, Claudia. Thank you so much for being with us. It's so, so great to be with you both, uh, Eugene and Sam. Sam, I'm sorry I have to meet you under these circumstances. Uh, I know, we I know. We'll get through it together. Florida. It builds a strong relationship. <laughs> yes. 
You know, Claudia, one of the things I wanted to start with, and you know, I was thinking of you all day about this because of you know, you recently were were, were speaking at Riverside Church on a similar issue. I mean, and that is kind of the the mirage of democracy as we see it in America. I mean, obviously, you know, there are important things about the right to vote. The exercise of the right to vote is is critically important and has to be defended. But when you really look at the whole spectrum of where it is, this the gap between the rhetoric and the reality, like they say, just show up today and it's all gonna be fine, um, just seems so huge. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important for for emphasizing, like in, we need to emphasize what you spoke about earlier, Eugene. You said uh, something about lesser of two evils and <laughs> the need to be able to learn from history. I think we continue to go in this insane circle of doing the same thing and not actually having different results. Um, the so-called world's greatest democracy has spent billions on this political theory. Um, and it does that th a theater and it does that every two or, or four years, you know, um, while people are suffering the lack of housing, actually one of the, the worst housing crises, the lack of education, the lack of healthcare, it says a lot about a system that is willing, again, to invest so much wealth in selling the illusion of democracy at a moment where people aren't able to eat to live dignified lives, facing the worst economic crisis, the worst inflation in so many decades. Um, this democracy was definitely not built to serve the people. It serves the capitalist white supremacist that, that you know, built this so-called democracy on the backs of black, brown people stealing our wealth. And they continue to do that. And it's important for you know, us to ask ourselves, who does this democracy serve? Um, some of the main issues around these elections is, you know, is about economy and the inflation, but no one is actually addressing it, giving an actual proper response to the issues that people are facing. No one's talking about people not being able to buy food, people, you know, the, the, the shortages. Um, it's just a waste of, of resources, a waste of, of time, of people's energy, and also a, a way of demoralizing people more, thinking people more into hopelessness where they already are. I think that it's important to note that, you know, as much as we want to talk about this so-called democracy and as much as people have actually struggled and bled and sweat um, to be able to advance whatever civil rights we have, all of those are in the chopping block right now. The Supreme Court single-handedly is rolling back so many of the advances we've made, and they're doing that precisely to set the stage for the the governance of, of the most conservative right-wing forces of the elite. Um, and it's important for us to have that in mind. Voter suppression is real. You've taught, we were talking, you were talking about that. Um, the same folks that are creating congressional um, boundaries are the, the same ones that are pushing for the Moore versus Harper case to actually win, to be able to roll back the right of people to have one vote. Um, it's, it's incredible what's happening, but no one is actually talking about these things because they want people to go out and vote. Um, and then after that, we'll go back to the same hell we've been in. So it's important to understand as much as this political theory is, theater, theater is happening and as much as we understand what's at stake, that whether we vote or not, Democrats or Republicans are not going to fix the issues that they themselves have cost mm -hmm. for the, the working class and, and the poor people in this country. Well, let me ask you this quick follow up on that, because I think that's an important question. And, and you know, our, our, our first guest, Rebecca, mentioned this, uh, you know, how, you know, voters, you know, they're all sort of parceled out, right? Like your number one issue is X, your number one issue is Y. But obviously real human beings think about kind of all the issues rolled into into one. And obviously with inflation being a huge issue, the other huge issue that's looming over that, right, is the issue of the war in Ukraine, which is, excuse me, you know, really at the root of a lot of the cost of living crises that are happening literally in every single country on earth. I mean, it really is amazing. And this has been an issue that Republicans have really tried to capitalize on right here towards the end in terms of, you know, I think to appeal to that complexity in voters' minds. I, I wanted to play this clip from Marjorie Taylor Greene, if we have it, on this very issue of Ukraine. Then I want to I ask you another question about this, Claudio. Oh, 
I probably spoke too soon. But anyway, this is it's her at a Trump rally speaking about Ukraine. Uh, Democrats have ripped our border wide open, but the only border they care about is Ukraine, not America's southern border. Under Republicans, not another penny will go to Ukraine. I'm sure. Hmm. Our country comes first. They don't care. At a Donald Trump rally who sent the first lethal weapons to Ukraine, by the way, but I mean, I mean, exactly. anything you want to say about that, Claudia, but it just the way that obviously they're trying to appeal to people who feel like, OK, I'm angry that it feels like all this war business in Ukraine is driving up my gas prices. But then linking it to the border crisis or whatever that means, it, it, I don't know, maybe let me not editorialize, but it just seems like this is another danger in a way is how when Democrats are presenting no alternatives to crises, how Republicans just pop up with this nonsense that rhetorically speaks to it, you know, but what does it really do at the end of the day? I mean, it doesn't, it, what it does is create this false illusion of difference between the Democrat and the Republican party, which is not, it's not really that much of a difference, really. They have a different approach to be able to save um, the wealthy and, and capitalism and imperialism, but not necessarily save anyone that is part of the working class or, or poor people. I think it's important that they do to say that they do sell half truth because they do in their fight to be able to sustain themselves as the legitimate party. They do sell half truths. Like it is true that the Biden administration has been advancing NATO in, in, in that part of Europe and it has been pumping money, billions of dollars, into war. Yes, that is true. That does not mean that the Republican Party is by any way, by any means, a friend of poor working class people. It really shows that they're saying, we will take care of home and our borders at home. They're still anti-democratic. They're still anti-working class people. They're still anti-immigrant. They're still anti-LGBTQ. They're still anti-working class women. I mean, you name it. Um, there are two wings of the same bird. Mm -hmm. And their only, their only uh, interest is to save the capitalist class, to save the wealthy. And so to do these type of things, to talk in this type of ways, talking half truth is precisely to move the hearts and minds of working class people who understand that the system is rigged, but the Republican Party is part of the rigged system. And so they, they're just trying to divorce themselves from, from the mess, but but they're part of creating the problem. Well, it's, it's, it's unfortunate how many people will buy into that lie that if you give the Republicans power, they'll, they'll cut off funding to the war machine, despite the fact that the Republicans have made the U.S. defense industry uh, a core constituent uh, for decades since its inception. So uh, this is like when Marjorie Taylor Greene says she'll get rid of the FBI, uh, <laughs> but she'll replace it with just a different police force to arrest doctors who perform gender affirming surgeries or, or whatever. Um, Claudia, I wanted to talk uh, more about uh, the voter suppression efforts we're seeing on the right. I've been covering elections for a while now, and I remember you know, a decade ago, longer, that these issues seem to be, uh, you saw, you know, liberal groups make a lot more noise about Republican voter suppression efforts when it came to like voter ID laws and voter caging. Uh, um, you had uh, the whole kicking people off role. You, you know, people watch Greg Palace films in which he's going to all these states and documenting how all these Republican secretaries of state are knocking people off, off the voter rolls. But it seemed like the, all that energy and momentum around those issues sort of went away after 2016. And it all the focus about voter suppression was funneled through a, a lens of Russian interference, that the major threat to our election is secret Russian operatives and Facebook memes, not Republicans who are uh, kicking 100,000 people off the, off the just not letting them vote. Um, do you see that as well, that sort of dynamic shifting in which, like, it seems that battle has been lost. Voter ID is here. It's just a thing that now we all are going to have to deal with. And all these other tricks that Republicans do to restrict the votes, it just 
they're allowed to do it now because they've been able to to kind of funnel these things while everybody's been distracted about Russian disinformation. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's very, uh, it's part of the history of this country to be able to distract the citizenship, to be able to distract folks, um, kind of stupefy us. We're all sorts of like misinformation. Um, And it's like, oh, the ball is bouncing. Follow the ball while they're doing other things on the other side, right? So like, one important thing that I, I think we should all be paying attention to is this Moore versus Harper case. Um, again, there is a lot that is at stake because this primary, like what is decisive around this, uh, around this case is precisely the objective of having the conservative right-wing Republicans lock control over the United States form of government for generations to come. And they're doing that with many other decisions. So today is decisive, but there's so many other things that are so much more impactful. Um, You turn on the news today, everybody's talking about, and it's great, primary elections, people voting, all these different things, the issues, the different candidates, but it's all a show. Um, And it's something that we've learned about the bourgeois democracy that we're in, that we basically put our, our faith our destiny in the hands of these wealthy politicians that will continue to advance the interests of the ruling class, not our own. And so when you're talking about voter suppression, there's so many different ways in which that happens. Eugene talked about imprisonment, you know, and people who are going into prison and catching federal cases for crimes of poverty, for the inability of being able to live. That's what the system does. It creates the conditions for people not to be able to participate in the so-called democracy. You know, the long lines, the closing of, of uh, poll, uh, voting uh, locations. This has been happening today. N- very little coverage has been done. You know, it's happened in Philadelphia. It's happened in Florida. It's happened in Texas. Um, all these different maneuvers that are very racist, very anti-worker to black people from exercising a right a right that so that that they've said they've given us but that in reality once it was taken in reconstruction the 1965 you know voting right act kind of said yes you do have this right but then we're going to figure out ways of still blocking you from doing it and you know prisons have been that um the way in which, again, con- congressional districts have, have been drawn. Um, so many different ways of in terms of like voter suppression and the way that voter discrimination happens. There, there have been folks that go and show up to vote and their names are not in the system after they've registered. And so, again, I think it's important to, to think about the fact that we live in a system that is an archaic system that is way, way old, that continues to be around the development of profit for the wealthy, that is continue to move on the basis of white supremacy and patriarchy um, and and uh, homophobic uh, ideals and xenophobic ideals. And in order for that to change, there needs to be a complete transformation of the system. And it won't happen through the Democratic Party and it won't happen through the uh, Republican Party. It has to be a a unified movement of the working class divorce of the two-party system. Because we've learned with history that it's impossible to think that any of these two parties will save us. We need to save ourselves. I I hear that. I think that that's, I mean, that's the key point in a way. I think it's a point of hope. I think that, you know, we can take as we continue to watch these election results and continue to let them go. In fact, before I let you go, Claudia, give me your 30 second words of hope here for people who are going to perhaps grow depressed as the night goes on. No, I think I, I, I would say do not grow depressed. I think that there is hope in many ways. Folks are wakening up to the reality that there is no hope in this voting system. <laughs> and that is not bad. Um, I think as organizers, as people doing the work, uh, grassroots, um, it's important for us to take stock of that and be able to organize that discontent. It's up to us to be able to do that. The only thing that we uh, have 
is understanding that throughout history, what we've gotten through these legal systems has been the result of struggle. And we can get more if we don't depend on the system to give us what we so rightfully need because they've, again, created the conditions for us to have to struggle for them. And so uh, Malcolm X, I'll leave you with that. Malcolm X, Malcolm X is always mm-hmm. a good person to you know, bring back into the... He said, we are not outnumbered. We are out organized. And that's the well, I guess we got to get on that it. We need to be able, to, we need to get on it and organize ourselves to be able to take power and not that Mickey Mouse washy wash type of power that they sell us, but the power and control of the economy, of politics, of society. And we, we could do that. Mm-hmm. Well, Claudia De La Cruz, co executive director of the People's Forum, and many, many other important critical things really appreciate you giving us some of your time here on election night 2022 thank you both thanks claudia well i guess we need to uh bring back sam knight because i hear that there's been a flip is that right sam a flip a seat flip there have been two flips actually uh Mm. both of them in the state of florida which is not a surprise because of uh, how Governor Ron DeSantis um, rammed through a highly gerrymandered uh, a map of congressional districts in the state. Uh, as expected, Florida's 13th congressional district has flipped, as has the uh, 7th congressional district. Uh, the 13th congressional district was uh formerly held by Charlie Chris, the Democrat who ran for governor against DeSantis. Well, he lost to the race. The governor's race has been called for DeSantis. And uh, Marco Rubio was also declared a winner of his reelection campaign. No huge surprise there. Uh, But we do have our first flips of the evening. Mm. Well, that's big. Our That's big. first flips <laughs> of the evening. So the uh, sound cue is uh, not yeah. Coming the, up, <laughs> so that's okay. It's okay. It's important because we emphasize that we there got were something flips there, and it was a slightly different sound than we rehearsed. But we'll work <laughs> on it. We'll have we'll give it we'll have a few different flip noises throughout the night because I'm sure there will be many. These are the if we got if, time if left. the predictions hold. Uh, these are the first of several flips in the house at least that we're expected to see tonight uh a quick call there in the senate race with marco rubio winning despite the mm-hmm. 16 million dollars uh spent um to try to defeat him it didn't work marco it rubio heading work. back uh to the senate I'm, i i would make fun of marco rubio being thirsty but i'm freaking thirsty i've been yeah well, that's okay all. take a drink and of water uh obviously a couple other hot under these lights i got lights here it's hot <laughs> you know we're, we're working through it here i sympathize with rubio a little bit on that taken back any times i've criticized him over that so much other things to criticize rubio on there, sometimes we all get a little thirsty okay <laughs> there are many without a doubt richard blumenthal in connecticut that's called uh fake vietnam veteran uh, Tammy Duckworth. <laughs> I just had to get that in there. He lied about being in Vietnam. Tammy Duckworth in Illinois, a real veteran, uh, also called in James Lakeford in Oklahoma, uh, and uh, Tim Scott in South Carolina. No one was surprised about those. Um, Alabama, also a quick call. Katie Britt was interesting in primary. But nevertheless, again, going back to the interesting. Team, keep, go ahead. It, it'd be, I'm just, you know, for, I'm just sending a message to our team here to, possibly get some of the latest numbers out of the Georgia Senate race mm. here as we head into uh, into this, our next guest shortly. Yes, 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 who is coming from Georgia. Hopefully he's he's in pocket. I'm, I'm waiting for confirmation, so I don't want to uh, fully announce him just yet. Well, uh, well in, in the meantime, maybe we can get Sam Knight uh, to give us uh, an update on some of those Virginia House races, particularly mm. – Abigail Spanberger here, who uh, has been one of the most vocal Democrats in opposition to the uh, defund the police movement, which all of like maybe three or four elected Democrats will even uh, consider. Um, And 
those three or four Democrats I mentioned, you know, member people like Cory Bush and Rashida Tlaib are having much better nights uh, at the uh, at the uh, uh, the the ballot box than Abigail Spanberger is tonight, and she still might prevail. She still might hold on, but her race is very much uh, a lot closer than uh, what uh, a lot of these squad members are dealing with. And and people will say, oh well, you know, Spanberger's in a more conservative district. What can you expect? Well, she's it's also a different message she's been running on. I mean, maybe that argument would make sense if she too was running on defunding the police and then right. she was blown out of the water. But she's been running on explicitly not doing that, and um, you know, she's she's facing a tough test here. No, I think that's very much the case. I, I mean, you know, you look at so much of what's happened in the demagoguing around this issue of crime. Uh, you know, Kathy Hochul, same thing, uh, running for governor of New York against Lee Zeldin, whose most recent ad was, vote like your life depends on it. It does. But, you know, the irony I pointed out to someone this morning, she spent the whole primary campaign basically saying the same things Lee Zeldin was saying against her more left-leaning uh, opponents in that race who were calling for, you know, more significant changes in terms of what was happening with policing and, and, and so on and so forth. I think we do have our next guest who is here for us. We also have... No, sorry, I was wrong about that. We do have Sam Knight, though, who is ready to come back in if we, if we can get him and chat a little bit about what's going on in some of these Virginia races. We've got him from the bunker. Yeah, so Spanberger, you know, not over yet, but it's, uh, I wouldn't feel great about this if, you know, I were particularly attached to her uh, <laughs> political career. Uh, she's down by 10 points with 38% of the vote in, uh, just further south on the Virginia, North Carolina border. Um, we have Elaine Luria down 16 points uh, with a third of the vote in. Things looking better for the House Democratic uh, contingent in Indiana, where Frank Mervin, uh, despite his, the lack of vowels in his name, he is up by a solid 20 points with 20% of the vote in. So he is off uh, to a decent start there. Gary, Indiana is delivering for Frank Mervin. <laughs> Home of the Jackson Five coming through for him. That's right. I will also say there's an interesting uh, race in Ohio's 13th district uh, where the Democrat there is uh, running to uh, replace Tim Ryan, who's obviously mm -hmm. running for Senate. And uh, she is ahead by a solid 30 points, 30 percentage points with 29% of the vote in. Uh, her name is Amelia Sykes. Now, this is this was uh, rated as one of the contested uh, uh, seats by Real Clear Politics. So, if Amelia Sykes and Frank Mervin end up uh, cruising to victory, that does not bode well for people who went on Predictit.org this morning and bet everything on uh, Republicans taking back control. Uh, Amelia Sykes as well is an interesting story. She is um, – the race is a real microcosm of the sort of national discourse that's going on um, or, or part of it. She has been a, 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 a state house legislator for several years, and her opponent is uh, Madison Jessioto Gilbert – uh, who is basically known for being a Trump booster and a uh, former Miss Ohio. <laughs> well, I mean, that's something to be known for, uh, for sure. Uh, sorry, Indeed. I just was trying to get a message across there. But yeah, well, interesting, you know, at the House level on a number of different fronts. Any, any, Anything else you're watching of note right but, now? Can we... Can we get an update on Georgia, the Georgia Senate race I think here? We I have think we numbers. might have some of the latest numbers. Uh, yeah, uh, Warnock. Yeah, Warnock right now is up by eight percentage points with uh, thirty-four percent of the vote in. He's up fifty-three point three to forty-five point one, uh, according to the numbers that I'm looking at right here. Yeah, it's going to be close, and you look at what's in and what's out there, county by county. Uh, you know, you've got in the Atlanta metro area over 60% of the vote in some of the counties. 
Seven percent though into Cobb County. I mean, obviously that'll be won by Warnock, but it'll be interesting. Southwest Georgia, another big Democratic stronghold. Black Belt, nothing there. A lot of deep red places in the southern part of the state. Florida Georgia Line, just giving that shout out. A lot of places up there that are big places for Republicans have not come in. So this, it's a nice, good, good early night for Warnock, but it looks like county by county could end up being a nail biter, Sam. Yeah, and, and the, and the uh, that they need to clear fifty percent to avoid a runoff there too. Yes, sorry, I th Sam Knight, I cut you off. I didn't know if you want to jump back in. Uh, yeah, the uh, race in North Carolina is narrowing, but is uh, gaining ground on Beasley though. Uh, she still has a six percentage point lead with about half of the vote, and I gotta say, if you're a Beasley supporter. Uh, before a single vote was counted, you would definitely take that. Same with Tim Ryan in Ohio, who 27% uh, of the vote in, he is up 13 points on mm. J.D. Vance. Wow. And there was some talk before the election of how a lot of, uh, you know, your typical Ohio voter probably looked at a guy like J.D. Vance with a significant amount of contempt. Um and but they were still going to vote for him because obviously Trump endorsed him. Maybe people are staying home because they just hate him and he has a very <laughs> annoying face. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that is only hope. a very well taken point that the, the Kemp Trump feud could hurt him, you know, at the end of the day here and, and certainly the other ones. Well, I'll tell you who Trump is 100% behind, and that is Herschel Walker. And so we are turning ourselves to the state of Georgia where we already, I guess, were. So we're not turning, we're just going deeper. And before we bring up our next guest who is gonna talk to us about Georgia, I just wanna preface this a little bit with, with one clip. Obviously, Herschel Walker is quite the individual in the Sunday before the election, that was this most recent Sunday, no, it was two Sundays ago, uh, Jamal Bryant, the Reverend Jamal Bryant uh, from New Bethel Baptist Church, which is a very significant church there in Atlanta, took to the, the podium, if you will, took to the pulpit, excuse me, to speak a little bit about Herschel Walker in a viral clip about what he felt the stakes were for black Georgians. So hopefully we can play that uh, uh, clip here and then we'll lead into our guest. Ladies and gentlemen, when the Republican Party of Georgia moved Herschel Walker from Texas to Georgia so that he could run for Senate, it's because change was taking too fast in the post antebellum South. The state had been flipped blue and there are some principalities that were not prepared for a black man and a Jewish man to go to Senate at the exact same time. So they figured that they would delude us by picking somebody who they thought would in fact represent us better with a football than with a degree in philosophy. They thought we were so slow, that we were so stupid, that we would elect the lowest caricature of a stereotypical broken black man as opposed to somebody who is educated and erudite and focused. Y'all ain't ready for me today. Since Herschel Walker was 16 years old, white men been telling him what to do telling him what school to go to, where to live, where to eat, where to buy a house, where to run, where to sit down, where to sleep, where to pay for abortions, where to buy a gun. And they, you think they not gonna tell him how to vote? In 2022, we don't need a walker, we need a runner. We need somebody who gonna run and tell the truth about January 6th. We need somebody who gonna run and push for the cancellation of student loan debts. We need somebody who gonna run and make the former president respond to a subpoena. We don't need a walker, we need somebody who will be steadfast unmovable always abounding knowing that your labor is not in vain georgia i need you to know the slave negroes y'all are used to don't live here no more we can think for ourselves function for ourselves and vote for ourselves why because we don't need a walker 
Don't need a walker, says Reverend Jamal Bryant. Well, we'll see if the state of Georgia wants a walker or wants another minister, the Reverend Raphael Warnock. We want to bring in, on that note, Aaron Thorpe from the state of Georgia. Some of you may know Aaron from the Trillbillies podcast. Some of you may know him as one of the most elusive men to follow on Twitter. Aaron, <laughs> thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, thanks for having me, y'all. And uh, I just want to say, go ahead, Sam, go ahead, Sam. I was just gonna, I, the Posadas Trap God himself here on the show. <laughs> yes, the elusive Posadas Honor. Trap God. Uh, thank you, thank you for having me, guys. Uh, and Sam, it's good to good to finally meet you, and um, good to meet you too, Gene. And I wanted to say that I had never seen that clip, mm. um, from the Reverend just now. And uh, I mean, just before we get into, it, I just want to say this: this race, the Senate race specifically, has been characterized for me by um racial identity politics. You know, mm. um, I think a lot of white liberals. Uh, Democrats were surprised that uh, someone like Herschel Walker exists, you know. Um, so it's it's definitely interesting to see the paradigms of race and class. And also, I think with the uh, the governor's race as well. Round two, we're seeing Stacey Abrams going up against Brian Kemp. So uh, I'm uh, I got my fingers crossed, I guess, for for Raphael Warnock. I know we were talking about liberal bourgeois democracy and how how it really can't live up to this moment. But um, I mean, these are neo-Confederates, you know? So we gotta do something about that, truly. Well, I I, I, I found the, the speech interesting. I'm just curious about the taxes exempt status of that church. <laughs> yeah, man, you know what? My, my god brother actually got uh, his graduation that church and it is very opulent, I'll say that much. There's no doubt about that. The Reverend Eddie Long put together quite a financial operation there, the late, Reverend Eddie Long. Uh, but no, I, I think you're making a very good point there, Aaron, about the nature of the Georgia race. I mean, you know, I remember Charlemagne the God was there and doing these events with like 21 Savage, who I, I think is is from Canada. But nevertheless, I'm happy that, you know, he's engaged in politics. But, uh, you know, so much of a focus around what sort of black men are going to do or not going to do. Are they going to vote? Are they not going to vote? Do they hate black women? Are they being attracted by Kanye West? And, and it really felt like to some degree that it was just taking everything away from the issues that that matter, you know, from those who are, uh, sorry, I think I froze there for a second, um, you know, from, from what do these people actually care about? And I feel like that's the element that to me was lost in the discourse about, you know, quote unquote, blackness in the election in Georgia. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, I'll say that, uh, you know, I mean, Georgians don't forget, right? We were we were promised. Well, everybody was promised two thousand dollar checks, right? Um, if we won, if Georgians won, Democrats the Senate, and uh, you know, I can tell you that I spoke to people who were very disappointed and demotivated, actually. But you know, people turned out, and I think that uh, when when you don't speak to the black community about issues that affect their lives materially, you know, um, of course it's voting rights, right? But it's also jobs and the economy. I mean, my own father uh, has said things like, you know, Trump would run the country like a business because he's concerned about the economy. And when Democrats can't even protect voting rights down here, much less make sure that, especially during and after the pandemic, not after the pandemic, the pandemic's still happening, during the pandemic, that people can work. You know, um, people get demotivated, but I will say that the turnout, early voting turnout has uh, been 2.5 million people, broken records, that's pretty insane. Mm -hmm. um, Voting today for me personally was relatively smooth. It usually is, but it's been that way across the state, um, mostly speaking. Um, so, I mean, you know, I hope that people will turn out, but it's what are the Democrats going to do with that majority if we give them that majority in the Senate, right? I don't mm -hmm. really have my hopes up. You know. I hear that. Well, they, they haven't, you know, done that much with it all, already. And in a way that really <laughs> screws over people like Raphael Warnock, who, you know, it's rare that Democrats get a Senate seat in Georgia, and it was under unusual circumstances in which Warnock won that race. And it became uh, sort of a referendum on what Democrats can do if they win. And he promised those checks. Absolutely. And you saw Warnock more than a lot of other Democrats fight for that stuff because he realized his political future was more tied up to it than other Democrats on the ballot. And, you know, here he is. And I mean, polling shows he's winning right now, but um, and hopefully he hangs on. Um, but if he were to lose, you could really see that as as a referendum on how Democrats have performed over the two last two years and how they haven't fulfilled a lot of the promises that they uh, put forward when they were uh, given a chance to take power in, in Congress and the White House. 
Absolutely. And I think that's that's the thing, right, is that especially with the black community, marginalized communities, if the Democrats basically say, who else are you going to vote for? Mm. You're not going to vote for the Republicans. Right. And, you know, we're really in between like a rock and a hard place where it's like, yeah, man, like, I mean, I yeah, I'm going to vote for Raphael Warnock. I'll vote for John Ossoff. Right. But if I'm going to put not even time and effort. Right. But even any faith right into this project, whatever project they have, which is none at all. Um, it leaves a lot to be desired, you know, and I remember that there were voting rights groups down here. I think it was Black Votes Matter. When Kamala, I think when Biden came to Georgia, they actually didn't show up. When Biden came to Georgia to talk about voting rights, they didn't show up because they said, y'all only come around here every two to four years, mm. right, just to get our votes. And then we don't hear from you until the next election cycle. And a lot of people turned, you know, they turned against those groups and said, oh, how could you do that? But no, they have a point, right? Um, I mean, black people down here are tired of, be, tired of being used as a cudgel. And I think that works in uh, Walker's favor because what the Republicans say is that the Democrats are puppeteering you. You know, mm. they say that to black communities. And sometimes that lands and that hits, frighteningly so. But, you know, we'll see, we'll, we'll see what happens tonight. It looks like Warnock, uh, he's a couple points up, so it looks like he might finish the night out. But if we're going to talk about the governor's race, too, there are people who vote for Warnock but then vote for Brian Kemp. You and know? that's an interesting dynamic. I mean, what do you think is driving that? Like the person who decides to go Warnock and Kemp, who do you, who do you think they are voter profile wise, avatar wise? And what do you think is motivating them? Yeah. Um, I think it was, I think it might've been Rebecca. I think it was the first guest that said, um, like people have a host of contradictory views, right? Mm. And nobody falls into any compartmentalized sort of ideology. Right. Um, and I think that for Republicans down here, um, Trump is, I wouldn't say he's anathema, right? But he's a little bit too grotesque, mm. aesthetically speaking, visually speaking, you know? Um, but someone like Brian Kemp, who's just as much as a venial Confederate, is a little bit more polite with it. The way that, you know, uh, Southern white folk down here are used to that sort of casual passive racism, not the legislation. The legislation is not passive at all. It's very explicit. Um, but they also like Raphael Warnock because he is... I mean, you know, he's 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 not a sociopath. His brain mm -hmm. is not riddled with like sw like Swiss cheese. Like yeah. obviously, like right, like Herschel Walker gives CT a whole new definition, right? They can see <sighs> that, you know. Um, but you know, it, it's troubling because it's reaction versus respectability. It's that driving mm -hmm. one of those many driving contradictions of American politics, where um, people are going to vote for reactionary politics and sometimes against their best interest, but it has to be in a nice package, right? And Georgia, I think, um, and it's promising in a way that Georgia is like this purple state, right? It is this battleground for those host of contradictory views, but it doesn't really mean anything if the Democratic Party can't, uh, cannot capitalize on that, right? Mm -hmm. No, I think that's such a good, uh, such a good point. And I remember it's, I mean, you know, even when New Georgia Project four or five years ago was signing up hundreds of thousands of people to vote, it was all about, oh, we're going to get Medicaid, we're going to do all these great things. So it was issue based. And, you know, on that note, I also wonder your thoughts, especially in a state like Georgia, especially in an area like Atlanta, what the kind of like down ballot boomerang is to a degree. Like I was thinking about mm. the 2020 uprising, the, the 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 George Floyd, a few others before that, the brother on top of the CNN sign. And, you know, the leadership of the city of Atlanta, people like Keisha Lance Bottoms and others, you know, have been so consistently against every uprising, every manifestation of like young black political leadership. And I just always wonder, like, how does that affect the average voter when they see like, oh, these people are all out here supporting these Democratic candidates, well, they actually represent something materially bad for me. I'm curious your thoughts about how that also impacts folks. Yeah. Well, um, you know, Cornel West talks about the black misleadership class, and mm. Atlanta has a history of that. You know, before Keisha Lance Bottoms, there was Kasim Reed. We used to call him Kasim Greed. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, Andre Dickens, who is the mayor now, he was a uh, council member uh, at large. And when I was in organizing, um, when I was working with housing advocacy groups, like he would speak to us, right? The mm -hmm. activists, he would speak to us. And it's very disappointing to hear him um, not only not be willing to close the Atlanta jail, you know, but um, expand it. It's very disappointing that um, funding the police more, you know? And I think that people, I think that people on the ground level, when they see this incongruity between deeds, between words, and between the sort of, I won't even just say grassroots because that makes it sound almost not even AstroTurf, but I'm talking about that genuine energy of the people that were at the CNN Center, not just breaking shit, but I'm talking about people that were 
peacefully protesting. It was all peaceful protesting, right? But I think that, again, that leads to a lot of a lack of conviction, you know? I mean, for older folks like my mom, I mean, the old guard, I mean, they're mm. going to vote Democrat all the time, right? My mom's also an immigrant, right? She's always voted Democrat. Um, and But I think that for the younger generation, like people that I talk to, I mean, they're very disillusioned, but they also have so much energy, right? Mm. They also have so much energy and they don't know where to put it. And they see that putting it in electoral politics, I mean, it's often like a kind of moot point, right? Because the politicians are unable to ride the wave of organ or actual genuine, whether it's from organizers or whether from communities, they're not able to ride and commit to that wave because, I mean, we live in a city where real estate runs all, you know? Mm. We have uh, not just uh, gentrification, uh, but we have dispel- development with displacement, people getting just pushed out. And people see this. And um, yeah, I, I don't know, man. I wish I wish that someone like Warnock could inspire um, people like Andre Dickens to actually, if you have a mandate, do something with it. Mm. But I sincerely doubt it, you know, because again, the restraints of capital. You know? Where where does a politician like Stacey Abrams fit in that? Is she, is she a break from this sort of, you know, misleadership class? Because I, I know a lot of people have... Um, you know, talked to about her back in 2020 as a potential nominee, and even a lot of Bernie supporters uh, have promoted her. But, you know, from what I've seen, it, she seems more in the vein of Hillary Clinton than like a Bernie Sanders as far as the spectrum of ideology on the Democratic Party. And she's right now involved in a close race here in this in this governorship. And if she wins, that's a whole uh a lot of things open up for her political career there. Um, but where, where do you see her as far as this kind of as a as a legitimate leader uh, at coming out of Georgia? Um, first, I want to say that uh, I kind of I kind of hate when and I'm not saying that I did a lot of work to turn voters out right in 2020. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that. But for somebody who has this organization, Verify, I think she got a lot of I won't say unfair credit, but it was really concentrated on her when there were a lot of other nonprofit grassroots groups doing the work. Um, I want to say that first, but of course, she's the face of it. Stacey Abrams is like Obama, right? You can, Obama, you can make Obama whatever you wanted to, right? You would fill in that void and he would be a chameleon who, whatever you wanted to see, that's who he would be. Mm-hmm. And that's Stacey Abrams, right? Um, you know, I'm not going to speak too much on the record because I personally don't know, but I do know one thing in terms of, um, I think, was it uh, tr- privatizing schools or charter schools in Atlanta, right? The Atlanta public school system. You know, um, I mean, she's a neoliberal, right? And I know that, like, a couple years ago, she, I think she, when she was in college or something, tore down a Confederate flag. And she, 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 again, from Atlanta, Black politician, you kind of are almost imbued with this history of activism and this legacy of activism, even if you didn't really do anything. I'm not saying she didn't. But, I mean, she's someone who I think got, take, took money from Michael Bloomberg, you know? I believe they had some relationship. So it's like... She's a Democrat, you know, I mean, and is she going to, she also said she was going to uh, fund the police. I remember there was that Twitter thread she did, which that shit made me, honestly, I wasn't going to vote for her, right? I voted today, but I saw that shit and I was like, yo, you're talking about giving these mother, if I, oh, I can curse, right? I can, that's yeah, okay, she's talking about giving these motherfuckers money. You're talking about giving these motherfuckers money, man, and they just fucking let a school classroom in, Flo- in Florida get shot the fuck up and not do anything, you know what I'm saying? Or in Texas get shot up and not do anything? And you want to give them more money and talk about they don't get paid enough? So, I mean, these are things, again, which, I mean, people vote for Democrats now because for whatever reason, they have the idea that they're going to uh, uh, pursue redistributive politics, um, also reform institutions like the police. I don't know why people think this, because the Democrats don't even push for it. And we know this to be the, uh, besides the case, because Stacey Abrams says it outright. But again, mm-hmm. I, was, I, was, I was mentioning earlier, what choice do Black people down here have and working people down here have when we are facing neo-Confederates. It's not like we're in a blue state, right? Which is bad enough. But we're talking about people who want to ruin the lives of my trans friends, my queer friends, right? My femme friends, you know what I'm saying? My black and brown friends. So, um, you know, I, I, just, I just hope that like, uh, at least, I mean, I don't know what I hope, right? Because after mm-hmm. saying all that, I don't know what I can really, what I can really hope that they could do, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Aaron, yeah, Aaron Thorpe, one of the uh, one of the Trillbillies, also a co-host of the Everybody Loves Communism podcast, right? Yes, yes, yes. yes. We're uh, it's a new podcast I started with my friends uh, Jamie and Jorge, and uh, if anybody wants to learn some communist theory, uh, because a lot of this is spectacle, right? Uh, you can list, you should listen to our show. Yes, great views on Star Trek too, but that's another show. <laughs> hell yeah, Thorpe, hell yeah! Really appreciate you being with us, man. 
All right. Thank you so much, guys. Appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah. Yeah, it's gonna be. All right, we'll bring on. Uh, yeah, we'll bring on our uh, next guest here in a little bit. Um, but let's bring back Sam Knight because I think we have some more uh, races news on races that are tightening up um, in North Carolina mm. and uh, in in Georgia. SK, there he is. What do you yeah, got for yeah, us? Yeah, yeah. No, you, I, well, you kind of scooped me there. The, the races are <laughs> tightening in Georgia and North Carolina. Warnock is uh, still ahead, but his lead is uh, much more slender. Uh, he is ahead of Walker by uh, 1.8%. About the, the Libertarian Party candidate down there is uh, making the difference. Mm. Uh, maybe Republicans should uh, like police a little less. Maybe you'd be ahead in Georgia right now, huh? <laughs> Uh, Sherry Beasley is also only ahead in North Carolina by about two and a half points. But, you know, I didn't think she'd be ahead at this point in the evening, and she still is. So good for her. I will say that Democrats are also appear to be uh, uh, comfortable for the moment in New Hampshire. There was some doubt about uh, the extent to which uh, the candidates there would – how they would perform – uh, they're doing pretty well in North Carolina's first house district, which uh, is currently held by the retiring G.K. Butterfield, uh, a leader of the Congressional Black Caucus, who tore into state uh, uh, Republicans for for their congressional district uh, redistricting after the 2020 census. Um, New Jersey as well. Tom Malinowski is doing OK so far. Uh, he... You know, there were some questions about to the extent how how well he would do, and he's he's doing okay there so far. And uh, uh, Mayor Fung in uh, Rhode Island, there, the uh, Republican who could potentially be uh, the first Republican to represent the state of Rhode Island and Washington in 15 years, uh, he is ahead but only by 0.8 percentage points with two thirds mm. of the vote. in. some of the polls had Fung there ahead of Magaziner uh, by five, seven percentage points outside of the margin of error. So a seat that uh, Republicans were hoping, really hoping to pick up, I'm sure uh, in new England going into the evening and uh, their lead is tenuous there uh, to say the least. Wow. That's interesting. Well, maybe maybe we can queue up uh, an update now coming from Ohio before we bring in our, uh, our guy on the ground in Ohio. Mm. Looks like Ryan is clinging to an early lead here, 54. Yeah, about 35% uh, of the vote in. Yeah. All right. Is Brian is Brian here? Brian Quinn. I think we have Brian. Radio, uh, Ohio native. There Brian. he is, host of Street Fight Radio, Brian Quinby. Uh one of the dads of the dirtbag left, a man who has logged more steps than Moses, probably. Mm. Uh, Brian, welcome to our election show. It's so good to have you. It's good to t- talk to you guys. I, I miss you, Sam. I haven't seen you in a very yeah. long time, my sweetie. Oh, I know. <laughs> it's been a while. Um, the last time we've really gotten to hang out was when we went on our trip together and the movie's coming out. Uh, times have changed considerably since then, but it's nice to uh, to relive them all. Uh, that was but things time. have gotten better, right? Since yes. then, like everything. Well, the improved. country has. To, there was a pandemic <laughs> that happened. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of what I had it's in all mind. Uh, it's all relative. But we're getting stronger. You know, we're all getting. We're learning and getting stronger. We're growing. Brian, uh, I know you're a huge booster of J.D. Vance here. You must be disappointed to see these early numbers coming out showing he uh, he might actually lose this thing. I really thought he was going to win, but also I thought he was running for governor. So I think uh, <laughs> I think well, maybe I, I've I was heard just you wrong on the whole thing. I've heard you for weeks uh, talk about how J.D. Vance is going to be the next governor of Ohio. So I figured we had you have you on our show for your uh, expert <laughs> political analysis from the Buckeye State. <laughs> oh, and Chris has joined us here briefly. Hey, uh, listen, early. But, you know, it's good to be in pocket early. I, I don't mean, know whose uh, audio we're is We're having on. a bit of a... 
I mean, well, uh, we've, uh, <laughs> it, it's just funny because it came right after Brian saying that J.D. Vance is running for governor. So it felt kind of like the right. The right level uh, well, we do have Chris that. from not even a show about to join us soon. We've lost Brian. Is that the case? Have we lost Brian or is he still? It here? seems like we He's may back. have. I'm checking on. Am I back? I mean, we're we all family here. We're all family. Brian and Chris know each other. You know, it's not a big surprise. Oh, uh, don't bring together, Chris on. Let's... <laughs> don't bring Chris on with me. I hate that guy. <laughs> He'll remain safely I'm backstage. Kidding. Okay. Okay. He Brian, what? What? Up. What? what, what, what Brian, what does the audience need to know about the typical Ohio voter? They're stupid. No, I'm kidding. They're, you know what's funny? I would have told you, this is what I was going to, wanted to say, is that I, I thought, I was like ready to throw my hands up and just be like, this is a deep red state. And, and it's maybe, I don't know why, it's because the only people I talk to out of my circle are my in-laws who really love Donald Trump. Mm. So it, it was kind of like, uh, uh, it's a surprise to me that Tim Ryan is winning. Now, I didn't want to vote for him at all. I did, uh, full disclosure, I did vote for him. Uh, I did not vote for James Dean Vance, although I thought, of, no I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but uh, I, you know what I wanted to say is like, anytime some lib says to me, like, uh, uh, don't forget... Uh, I, I'm glad I you went out and voted today. I can say, yep, J.D. Vance, one more vote in the win column for that guy. <laughs> but that's just me being a dick. No, seriously, I thought it was a red. I thought I lived in a red state, and uh, you know, deep red state. So I will be surprised if Tim Ryan wins. Although, I think the typical Ohio voter one doesn't know who J.D. Vance is, and two, uh, if they do, they don't like him. Because he doesn't feel like an Ohio guy at all. I thought he was the most authentic, the hillbilly elegy. Oh man, you that think makes he me was addicted crazy. to opioids the way he talks about it. I mean, <laughs> Jesus. Well, that's the thing is like the idea that like some hillbilly or, or or like somebody that would call themselves like a redneck, you know, that drives the 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 truck with like <laughs> Trump flags flying and stuff, would at all be interested in JD Vance. To me, is just I don't know what how it happened. I really don't. You know what's well, crazy got, if you think about it is oh. J.D. Vance, Dr. Oz, and Wes Moore is running for uh, governor of Maryland are all Oprah-launched personalities. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, but I did know J I didn't know J.D. Vance was one. Is His Dr. Book. Oz winning currently? D I, you, you know, I think Dr. Oz is not winning currently. <laughs> no, but only 9% of the vote is in. Yeah, not much, want, not much I, in yet. And I know I'm allowed to say this on here because I'm part of Means TV. Got a movie coming out and a TV show coming out. Dr. Oz has humongous balls. Did you guys see that? <laughs> I have not seen his balls, no. I'm curious where I, you saw them. I have uh, not. Saw them. Oh, Sam, I could, se I could send you the picture, but there's a picture he took at the cheesesteak place. Gino's, probably the racist one. I'm Definitely, sure. that's the Where racist he's like, one. He's got his hand up like he's like, uh, uh, I don't know, like putting up the fist. And like all <laughs> my nice. eyes were drawn down <laughs> because it just was like... There was so much hog down there, down one side of his leg. Now, people have told me that's not hog, so I, but they're huge. And it's a famous thing because I noticed it with my eyes. And then people started sending me whole Reddit threads about Dr. Oz's beans. I guess, you know, wow. people have seen them in other pictures. So, question if that's a secret source of votes for him tonight. <laughs> feeds. <laughs> He's a stuff in some ballot box there. Uh, he seems Brian, like somebody sounds, nobody likes. Sounds like you've got a, a companion piece for your uh, Naked Wrestler series here. Uh, naked Politicians coming out uh, next. I, I wish I could find some. I don't think they're the same as wrestlers. I think I've thought about it in like maybe football. The muscles news. really make it. You know, the muscles make yeah. it work. Oh, and and I want to say the last time I was on Means morning news it was to talk about vince mcmahon who is now gone yes, so i thought I would, oh he died update that no no i wish <laughs> yeah definitely 
I feel if if you know he hasn't died, you'll know he's died because in his will he'll require them to like you know put a mausoleum where he's permanently on display, like a Vita or whatever at the WWE headquarters in Connecticut. <laughs> a, a picture came out last night of him at a restaurant with a with a woman and. His face looks like a full square now, so I don't know what kind of plastic surgery that is, but uh, <laughs> pretty amazing that I came on here and said he will never retire, and now he's gone. So mm. that's how much stock you can put into my uh, political. Uh, <laughs> well, you didn't talks. see the whistleblower coming. You didn't see the whistleblower. I didn't. Coming. They never that's do. Right. No. But shout out to that whistleblower. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's there's still i guess uh a lot of votes still be to count jd vance could still mm -hmm. be your uh senator or 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 governor brian um uh if he does win he will have to thank peter Thiel, who has spent more on him on him than any person has ever spent on a senate candidate peter Thiel is silicon valley uh billionaire uh, a guy who like wants to have human blood bags around him to replenish his own. So alleged, I should say allegedly. Yes. Uh, <laughs> wants to have this. Um, what? There is another guy is here. I will say this: there is another guy here. I think his name was Joe Blystone, and he was like a fake cowboy, but he like put in the work, and he had like cowboy. He wore a cowboy hat. He had a farm. He was on a tractor, and he was kind of like one of those Duck Dynasty type guys, mm. where if you looked at him like six months before he started running, yes, he was kind of like JD Vance. But I think that like, I think people sniffed out. JD Vance and I I don't know how to uh do the stats or anything like that but my guess is that there are a lot of Republicans that are sort of uh either voting for somebody else or just you know leaving that blank cuz I just I can't imagine my like I look at my father-in-law and I'm like I don't I don't see a world where he votes for JD Vance I think people sniff out a fake and uh He's a fake, like, and people figured it out. Yep. Well, uh, Brian Quinby, the uh, host of Street Fight Radio and all its subsidiary productions that come out of that, um, people can subscribe on on Patreon. Uh, and also a uh, star of the new show coming out, uh, the Street Fight TV show and the... Uh, the documentary Yell, Stomp, Piss, uh, in which uh, myself and Sam Knight as well uh, and the Trillbillies participate in. Great. Thanks for coming on the show, Brian. One, one of the best times. And also tell Chris I was really smart on here when, when he comes. <laughs> I, I, I will. I will. We're going to see who is smarter. <laughs> no, don't do that. Thanks, Brian. Because he yeah, might be thanks. smarter than me. Bye, guys. <laughs> thanks, Brian. Uh, and also just a good moment to remind people um you know if you have the chance some people are already watching on uh means tv you can become a subscriber you too could be watching on means tv you can see the new documentary and the new show coming out from brian and also the documentary that features both sams that have been on this show of course if you're watching on the breakthrough news youtube you can hit subscribe hit the bell and get alerts but Real realistically, and I think as this was very well promoted, this is the only election coverage tonight that is not totally controlled by venture capitalists, uh, other big Fortune 500 companies, and other people who are causing inflation. So we do need your support as subscribers, as donors, as supporters, as sharers. So if anything we're doing seems worthwhile to you, now is the time to take some sort of action, both financially and via -a -v, clicking the right buttons. Thanks for uh, doing the plugs there, Eugene. I keep forgetting the more that you do, the the, the less that I have to do. <laughs> it is now past 9 p.m. We've got polls closing in Arizona, Colorado, Kansas, Louisiana, Michigan, Minnesota, Nebraska, New Mexico, New York, North Dakota, South Dakota, Texas, Wisconsin, Wyoming. I think it's probably uh, maybe we should check in on the needle. Do we have the needle somewhere? Mm. The New York Times New York needle, Times which is forecast. forecasting. Uh, who will be in control? The needle is down. I'm being told that the needle is already mm, down. The needle is already down. Needle What's going on? In 2016 uh, as being totally unreliable. And uh, it appears to be totally unreliable. Um, Yet again. Uh, right now as well. Maybe we've got Sam Knight. Is Sam Knight uh, available? Our own human needle uh, following the races here tonight. There it is. You don't have to worry about the programmers on the back end. Back. 
I guess maybe let's start with some of these important Senate races that are going to determine control of the Senate. Uh, in Georgia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania. We should start uh, getting some numbers in on those, right? Yeah, well, for a while there, Georgia was whipsawing back and forth between Warnock and Walker, and Walker had actually taken the lead. Uh, now it looks like Warnock uh, has a sizable lead once again. I assume maybe a, a, a whole cache of ballots from Fulton County, uh, which is in Atlanta, were maybe counted up. Uh, and uh, the, the, it just bumped up Warnock a few points. Uh, in North Carolina, however, uh, Sherry Beasley has relinquished the lead uh, to a human charisma uh, explosion, Ted Budd, who is uh, now up <laughs> by 0.4 percentage points. Um, mm. it, J.D. Vance is narrowing the gap in Ohio. He's only down by three points now with 37% of the vote. And uh, I will say disappointment for Republicans in Rhode Island who now look like they are, it hasn't been called yet, but Magaziner now has a four percentage uh, point lead over Fung there. And Fung, of course, was uh, Republican Party's best hope for uh, a, an eye-popping flip uh, in New England. And uh, by the way, I've been told that our flip clip uh, had some copyright issues, uh, so we don't have our flip sound cue. Um, yeah, Fung, uh, mayor, the mayor of Cranston, I believe, he was, he was going to be the first uh, U.S. rep from Rhode Island to represent the Republican Party since uh, before the Newt Gingrich era, uh, it, which started, of course, in 1994. And uh, now that looks like that is not happening. But mm. uh, yeah, uh, Republican Senate chances looking better in North Carolina of holding on to the uh, seat that is being uh, relinquished by retiring Richard Burr, who is going to do some insider trading in the private sector now, uh, allegedly. I will say, I will say, you you were talking about the needle, yes. and uh, what better needle uh, than money itself? Mm. <laughs> and I'm, I'm looking at Predict It now, uh, the website where you can bet on uh, political outcomes. Republicans are very confident about uh, JD Vance's ability to pull this one off, and uh, about Herschel Walker's. Uh, chances of winning. Not so confident in Dr. Oz, however, Pennsylvania leaning toward Fetterman right now. Uh, not so confident in uh, Blake Masters, the other Peter Thiel candidate, Arizona uh, trending blue. They're pretty confident in flipping Nevada, although obviously uh, we're waiting for numbers to come in there. And Wisconsin, uh, which predict it says should be in the hands of Republican Party and Ron Johnson uh, by the end of the night. Excellent. Thank you, right. Sam. Other Sam, yeah. I think we might have our next guest here. I don't know if you want to. Yeah, uh, we'll bring up uh, Chris in just a second, uh, who has had a chance to interview a lot of the Republicans that, uh, l let's say, a lot of the um, uh, kookier Republicans that are on the ballot uh, this election. Um, <laughs> Chris is, is Chris James is the host of not even a show. So he's, he's not even a host. Um, before we bring him on, I want to play this clip of Chris interviewing uh, Mark Fincham, who is running for Arizona Secretary of State. Uh, so let's go. This is a clip from Chris's okay. show. Are you able to see that? Uh, yes. OK, so it says, hello, sir. Uh, thank you for helping to make elections fair. Uh, how come you always wear a cowboy hat if my mom says you were born in Detroit? OK, that's kind of funny. That's kind of funny. Well, that's um, yeah, so, I guess. Is that true? You are. Uh, I thought you're you're born in Arizona. No, are you born in Detroit, Michigan? So I was born in Detroit, Michigan, but I spent nothing but a couple of uh, 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 early months in my life there and then we moved i see okay i got you yeah so, that makes sense so you're you're a born and bred cowboy that's kind of a that yeah. was a silly one let's let's see here um we got the next one here though um mr fincham in my class we have a pet rat and my teacher named it mark fincham she is my grade four teacher miss evans 
That doesn't seem. I, I don't. I don't know. The kid even knows there at that point. It seems like yeah. the teacher is probably like a liberal type, guessing, yeah, the te- type person, and then they don't even realize. <laughs> um, okay, this next one, Mr. Fincham, your cowboy hat is a hat for cowboys. How come you are always dressed like it's on Halloween? Another liberal. Okay. <laughs> um, next one. Why don't you, your kids want to see you anymore? Are you a bad daddy? That's horrible. This is trolls. I think. <laughs> I think this is trolls that have co-opted it, like liberal trolls. Warren, who's who's moderating this? (laughs) Chris James joining us now from Mm. not even a show. Hey, Chris, welcome. Hey, thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, that that was a clip where the end the end part there. Actually, some people who watch my channel got a little bit mad at me, said that I maybe took a little bit too far when I brought up the fact that it's it's a is adult children don't want to talk to him anymore. Just to be clear, <laughs> um, but yeah, they thought maybe that was a bit too far. But yeah, that was um, that was one of my big gets of this um, of the the this election season. Uh, Chris, you've had a few uh, agits, and we'll play a, a, another clip or two here in a little bit. How do you, how do you pick who you're going to target? Like, what what made you think like Mark Fincham? I'm going to get this guy. Well, Mark Fincham, I mean, there's some high profile people like Mark Fincham who they're all over the news cycle, or at least the horrible one that I subscribe to uh, on social media. And so ones like that, it's it's not too difficult. The more difficult thing is trying to like I had to go through. He has, you know, a communications person or whatever. He has somebody actually running his. So it's a little more difficult. But a big way that I choose who I'm going to interview, a, a new uh, method I found was I just go to the war room with Steve Bannon and I just see who he's interviewing and then I just reach out to them directly and it just, it, it really helps things out. It streamlines things, you know? I saw uh, you on oh, Steve Bannon. That's got to be, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, also, it seems extremely easy to get these guys every time you uh, uh, bring them on. And I want to I want to play another clip here in which you uh, interviewed um, someone who's running, uh, Irene Armendariz Jackson, I'm, I'm, I'm getting your name about as well as you did, uh, who's running for Congress in Texas's 16th uh, district here. And, uh, you know, this, this, this clip, I think, is going to illustrate a bit just how uh, committed your guests are to being a part of this bit, whether they realize it or not. Mm-hmm. Hello, everyone. Yep. Welcome to the Calm Corner. Um, I'm your host, as always, Michael J. And um, here on this program, we talk about serious political subjects matter, but we do it in a calm way. Um, we have an emphasis on calmness. I think something that's missing in today's political discourse. And today we're joined by, uh, she's running in Texas's 16th Congressional District. Um, and her name is uh, Irene uh, Fuck. Mm, sorry, I'm in the run up to it. I can't be fucking. Okay, that's my bad. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, man. <sighs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Calm Corner. I'm your host, Michael Jack on. Um, Today, we're joined, we're discussing uh, serious political subjects, but we do it in a calm manner and something that I think is missing in today's political discourse. Today, we're jurned. Jurned. Fucking. (laughs) Fucking jurned. Jurned. Fucking jurned, man. Are you kidding me? Jurned. You fucking... Fucking unbelievable. <laughs> Fucking unbelievable. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Calm Corner. I'm your host, Michael Jackon, and we discuss political subject matter, but we do so in a calm. So- <laughs> it's in my fucking head. <laughs> in my fucking head. The music switch is How long does that go on for, Chris? How long did that go on for? 
I mean, it goes on for a long time. It actually, I'm always surprised because I always kind of write them out and I expect them to hang up. And I just realized after doing a few of them that I, I, I can't do that. I have to write an ending to it because they will not hang up. They're just it's a bizarre thing to me where there's this idea that like any publicity is good publicity. And just to be clear, I, I have sort of like, I have a fake email and a fake website. It's, it sort of seems like it's behind a paywall. So that is why there's no content. It's all paywalled. And I have like a producer email and a phone number. So there's a little bit to it, but if you did a little bit of research, if you just went and looked for a second, you'd figure it out. So, but these people are so fucking desperate for any sort of publicity that they'll stay, they'd stay on for an hour with me doing mm -hmm. that shit, you know? Yeah. So. so, so what's the plan after the midterms? I mean, you're not going to have as many, I guess, of these uh, candidates to choose from, but I guess it's perpetual election. 2020 is coming just around the corner. People are going to be calling. You'll still have a pretty rich vein to tap into. Yeah, I mean, my whole my plan initially, and it, it does make it a lot easier. The elections make it a lot easier because people are just, oh, I'm gonna, I gotta do everything. I gotta get out there, you know. Uh, but there is this weird thing where I feel like a lot of people who are candidates, even in lower for lower office, they're not really thinking about it in that way. They're thinking about the long term already. They're just thinking about becoming like a a person in the party and just a name. And so I found that you, I like, I interview these people after they lose in the primary, like in, in the, or in the, yeah, like they'll lose the Republican primary by a considerable amount and I'll interview them afterwards. Like, Hey, I just want to see what your net, what your plans are. And they're like, yes, this is, that seems normal, you know? Um, so yeah, I think it's, I'm just going to interview people. I, I'm going to do a segment called the losers lounge where I have people on who, were projected to win and who lost and i'm just gonna sort of you know make fun of them about that i guess for a while dissect their political strategies uh chris james the host of not even a show where can people uh watch it i know they can watch it on means tv uh plug any other uh channels and projects you're working on chris I mean, watch it on Means TV. That's the best place to watch it because YouTube's the other option. And I know for a fact that they'll play fucking ads. I don't have it monetized on YouTube, but they play bullshit ads. And because I'm pranking people like Prager and Gorka, they'll start fucking recommending their actual content to you. And it's just, a, I wish I didn't, I wish there was an, a better option for, you know, mass. So yeah, go on Means for sure, but you can find it on YouTube. And yeah, check on Twitch. I have a Twitch stream as well where I, play geo guesser and and it's a more relaxed time over there so come check me out on twitch as well right on well uh keep keep up the important work and thanks for uh dressing up and putting a tie and combing your hair for us uh tonight no on our, uh, election special <laughs> <laughs> it's a very professional group of people here we don't play around at all when it comes to professional i have to say sam i'm a little i'm a little surprised that you still got the jacket on at this point of the night Thought your sleeves might be oh, rolled up here. I, I thought they would up. be too, but I'm afraid if I take it off, I'll yank my earphones out too and cause a whole mess here. But respect, yeah, we'll, you'll suffer we'll through. Loosen, we can loosen up. The, we can loosen up the tie a little bit, I suppose. You know, we're getting here to the bottom of the bottom of the sixth inning here in our show. We, it's we, only six we, innings. we are indeed getting into the bottom of the sixth. Thing is, I'm not thinking about any relievers. You're you're really no, you're pitching no. them well. We, yeah, no, we're sticking in here. We've got a no no going. And we're not pitching around anybody, but uh, we've got uh, uh, we've got our next guest who's ready to go here. So I will move in that direction. Sorry, I just wanted to check something quickly. But very happy to be joined as we continue our coverage here. Election night, twenty twenty two breakthrough news means morning news you can find on Means TV by Phil Agnew of Black Men Build, amongst many other superlatives I could throw out there. Philip Agnew, thank you so much, sir, for being with us. Hey, I'm very happy to be here. Really happy to be here. What's up, Eugene? What's up, Sam? Good to meet you all here. Hey. Yeah, well, yeah. Good to have you on, Philip. Thanks. It's a true, yep. true honor. And I, and I want to start maybe just by getting your reactions to some of the framing of this election, some of the ridiculous flaming of this election. I guess we could start on anything, but you know, one is around the issue of so-called crime. And we have like a, a super cut here of some ads from I think Arizona and Philadelphia, excuse Jesus, Arizona and Pennsylvania that I wanna play and then we can get into it. Cool, let's do it. For decades, crime was falling in the United States. 
no more. In Phoenix, murders and aggravated assaults are on the rise. Joe Biden and Senator Mark Kelly are letting violent criminals terrorize our state. Mark Kelly voted against a measure to put violent predators behind bars. And so our bloody nightmare rages on. Cities in chaos, families in fear, a hell of violence and death. Stop the insanity. Mark Kelly erased our border, and now cartels are killing children with drugs disguised as candy. Fetterman's plan on crime. Release one-third of prisoners. And cash bail. Putting violent criminals right back on the street. And vote to release murderers over and over. John Fetterman, helping killers kill again. Yes, there you have it. Uh, I was watching football Saturday night. That was like 75% of the ads, Phil, but just... Your thoughts? What kind of what kind of drug filled candy were they talking about here? I'm curious about that. Fentanyl, yeah, fentanyl skittles. Oh well, that's not fun. Um, no fun at all. No fun at all. Marshawn Lynch would not like it. Mm. Um, <laughs> oh, do we lose uh -oh. Phil? Might have frozen on us. The, all right. Uh, well, we'll work on uh, we'll work trying. on getting him back there. Uh, on a few different points. Uh, you know, I mean, it's just, it is really actually amazing because crime is actually, like the first one started with crime is down for 30 years or whatever. Crime is still down on 30 years ago. If you compare it to where it was in the 90s, it's record lows. I mean, obviously there's the whole other issue of whether like more cops on the street, tougher laws actually deter crime. And certainly longer sentences, tougher laws are proven to not deter crime, by the way. And more cops, you know, the jury's still out scientifically on that, but what I can say is it's not a clear cut thing if you increase the number of cops either. So there's sort of two lanes to it. I think we have Phil back here. Yep. Perfect. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, no, you you were touching right on it. First off, the ra the ads are one hundred percent racist. You know, let's let's call it out. Let's be clear. It's one hundred percent not a dog whistle. It's a megaphone. You don't want these Negroes out on the streets doing random things, raping and taking your wives and doing all type of things. But it completely absolves the political establishment for the fact that they have taken every single semblance of things that that a society needs in order to be civilized: jobs, education, health care. Um, community centers, everything that a people needs completely have taken it out and puts the blame squarely on the very people who have had all of those things taken away from them. And so uh, not only does it drum, 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 drum on the racist drum beat that the Republican Party has been going on for many, many years, but it also completely what, like I said, cleans the hands of the fact that both parties have been a part of decades of eviscerating the social welfare system, ensuring that our communities don't have anything uh, anywhere near what they need, right? Um, and then claims that if Republicans are in power, everything is gonna get better. And like you said, police have not been shown um, to decrease crime at all. In many of the places, the police are the biggest criminals, uh, the biggest organized gang across the country. Um, and these ads, you know, we see it. We see it over and over, and they gotten even more egregious. I thought you were gonna show the one from Louisiana, um, where the guy said at the end of it, it, it you know, call a crackhead. You know, they yeah. they're they're not hiding. Don't call the police. Call a crackhead since you want to defund the police. They're not hiding what they're trying to do anymore, but they are very very stealthily, as Claudia was saying before, um, placing the blame on the people for the crimes of the state. They say vote like your life depend on it, but they don't govern like our lives depend on it. You know, you are in Florida, interesting state, obviously. I mean, I think most of the elections there were relatively expected for Republicans to do pretty well. But, you know, that being said, you know, there's a couple of issues I just want your reflections on. I mean, number one, Florida, despite passing with 70 percent of the votes, a law that would at least allegedly allow those who've been formally incarcerated uh, to vote still remains the number one state in America in terms of the numerical number of people disenfranchised because of a former, uh, formerly being incarcerated, a so-called felony conviction. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm curious your thoughts about that in general, but I'm also curious your thoughts about maybe a perennial question, maybe not 100% only relevant to Florida, but I know the work you all do in Black Men Build, you know, which is, I think, with a 
element of the population, younger black men in particular, who, you know, are said to be disengaged, said to be, you know, totally disaffected and, and so on and so forth. You know, so for the average person in, I don't know, my Florida geography isn't as good as it used to be in Liberty City or whatever it may be. I mean, what's That's engaging that person? And what are the two major parties missing when they talk about turnout in neighborhoods like that? Sure. So uh, shout out to Desmond Mead and the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. We were a part of that coalition. Returned the right to vote to 1.2 million people in the state of Florida who had a former felony conviction. Now, the voters in Florida passed that almost overwhelmingly by Florida standards, passed this law overwhelmingly. Immediately after that, Ron DeSantis comes in and says, you know what? I know what you all said, but I don't think you all really meant that. You all really meant that a person should not be on probation and, that, and should have paid all of their probationary fees before they get the right to vote. And so what they did was added another obstacle um, in order for millions of people to have their right to vote. And then you still got millions of people that don't know. You know, they don't know that this law got passed. They don't know that they have the right to vote. And then you've got the state of Florida, which gives out felonies like candy. So, you know, you can get a felony for letting go of a helium balloon. You can get a felony for uh, stepping on a turtle egg for an endangered species. You can get a felony for being a black kid in school. You know, you can get a, be, be a, get a felony for being a black kid who doesn't go to school. Right. And so these are the these are the ways that which of which the state of Florida, in addition to the gerrymandering that you mentioned a little bit earlier, has been able to maintain control over a state um, uh, uh, with an iron grip. And DeSantis, you know, overwhelmingly beats Charlie Crist. And we see Val Demings going down again to, to Marco Rubio. When we're talking to people and what both parties are missing, but we'll talk about the Democrats since they ostensibly are, are, are the people who are supposed to represent us. They are not talking about the material conditions and what people actually need, right? We're talking, they talk in platitudes. Uh, the entire conversation political arena has been set now by the right. So all we do is respond to the right's talking points. But no one is talking about food, schools, houses, money. Uh, no one's talking about the things that animate somebody to move out of their house. Every single day we have people young people, poor people, black people, Latino people risking life, limb, and health to put food on the table. They would absolutely go out and vote for a candidate who talked about food on the table. They would absolutely go out and talk about a candidate who said, you know what, Liberty City, since you brought it up, how about we don't turn your entire neighborhood into an Airbnbs? How mm -hmm. about we make sure you could stay in your grandma's house? How about we make sure that your school that you go to isn't crumbling and that you have books and you have all the things? How about we pay that teacher who gave you a ride to school today, even though they weren't supposed to, but they think you're a good student? How about we pay that student a little bit more? How about we don't put your little brother in jail for 15 years? How about we talk about these things that would animate any rational human being? And they don't do it. And so you've got a left or you've got a Democratic Party that completely is talking about a, from a script on a stage in a theater that is completely removed from the everyday lives of people. And so what we have to do is show them or convince them really, right? It's convince them that this vote not only is a vote for somebody who cares about your material conditions, even though they never bring it up, they, they will soon, hopefully, if we keep pushing. And then we have to convince them that their vote will be counted and actually mean something as well. And so it's a very uphill battle, but we're trying to build a base of power. And as Claudia said, and you saw Hiram, shout out to Hiram, he was talking in the chat. We're talking about building independent political organizations. So the, the script, when we're talking to people at the door, isn't so much go out and vote. We didn't do much of that. We, we don't do much of that, honestly. What we say is join a political organization that is made up of your neighbors, of your brothers, your uncles, your, your, your people who are already around around you. And what we're going to do is we're going to build the dual power mechanism to push or build an alternative that gives us what we need. And that is what the Democrats consistently fail on. They're cowards. They do half measures. Um, they don't do anything they're supposed to do. And they take all of the blame and take none of the credit. And it makes it easy for for the Republicans. You were you were involved with the uh, Bernie Sanders campaign in in 22 which 2020 which seemed to be the last time that or you know one of the few times that there's been a force trying to uh, get the Democratic Party to 
uh, focus on those things you mentioned to reorient itself toward uh, working class issues, uh, toward providing material benefits to people. And, you know, since 2020, it's kind of all dissipated. I mean, yep. Medicare for all was a major issue during the 2020 election. As yeah. soon as it was over, despite there being a pandemic still going around, there's almost no mention of of Medicare for all. I know people have talked about, uh, you know, Bernie running again in 2024. Um, but even that, I'm not sure he is the kind of guy who wants to build an independent um, uh, organization or, or structure that you're speaking of. He's He seemed to have used his prior campaigns to, you know, push people into the Democratic Party in hopes of changing that party from from within. So where do you see the, the, the where do you see the sort of vehicles or uh, avenues of organizing to sort of build these independent structures to either force the Democratic Party to change or build something to replace it? Um, you know, I think what I've what I've been witness to in Jackson, Mississippi, with the People's Assemblies, it's a it's a mechanism that um, the Malcolm X grassroots movement and um, uh, uh, the Lumumbas have spearheaded in Jackson, which is a dual power mechanism. It convenes the people and puts them in a position to be a part of the budgeting process, a part of the priority setting for the city. And then they push and advocate it for a mayor that came from their ranks, can respond to their power and can talk about governing in some sort of democratic way. I think that's one model that is worked that doesn't get pulled from theory, but it's a it's a it's a a methodology that is working. I think there are critiques about it and shortcomings, obviously, but that is one way to do it. I think for us and how Black Men Build sees it is we've got to, one, build up the ability to provide for ourselves. And that's what we, we do in a number of our cities. We provide medical care. We're working on providing housing to people, providing jobs for people, et cetera. But we've also can't can't leave the fact that there are real institutions in our cities, our counties, our states, and our, our national infrastructure that govern us, that decide what happens. And we've got to do the the, the hard work of knocking on doors, of talking to people, of doing the political education, recruiting them into our organization, building a mass line, and then pushing them to either run for office or advocate, protest, shut down, do whatever is required to apply the pressure and the leverage to move government into the way we want. That's the way that we see it right now. That's the model that we think is most relevant to the conditions that we live in right here in the United States is to, is to, you know, in Florida, running as a third party candidate, you know, I'm a registered Democrat in Florida, I'm an independent, but I can't participate in the primary um, if I'm an independent in the state of Florida. And so the way things are and as they are, as they are built, we've got to fight for governing power within the Democratic Party. I don't believe in the Democratic Party as a vehicle for revolution or liberatory activity, but I will say that it is what we have right now, and we should not leave the Democratic Party to the conservative neoliberal wing of it that has controlled it for many, many years. And I think it is worth contending for it, but you don't contend for it by hoping that we've got some charismatic candidate who's going to go in there and change it on their own. We've got to build up these, you know, the WFPs of the world, I think, are working uh, on a theory of change that they're moving. I think for us, for Black Men Build, we want to have a block of brothers, sisters who have, who have joined the organization and lead the organization who can move along a mass line and push an agenda that other people have to respond to. I think it's too general to say we want to be a Tea Party and you know how the Tea Party was able to move in advance. Um, but it is akin to that. And I think that there are a number of places that we have just given up where we can win real governing power within the Democratic Party and push. But I don't think it's all about electing a candidate. I think it's an agenda that we move people towards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Philip Agnew, Black Men Build, as always, very happy to have the opportunity to build with you, my brother. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I can't wait to come back. Absolutely. We will have him back on many shows. We always love to have Phil on Breakthrough News. Interesting perspective on many, many different fronts and very important work they're doing there at Black Men Build. But the election night, 
It's rolling on. We are here. Breakthrough News means morning news. We're on Facebook live. We're on YouTube live. We're on Means TV live. So subscribe, share, donate, do whatever you got to do because we still got some show left. Sam Sachs. Totally live, not even on tape delay. Something awful could happen and it just goes out. You know? That's true. You don't even it's have the, someone, the delay. <laughs> you know, I was, some people know I was reporting from Haiti last year and like the third day we got there, there was a pastor, this is actually not that funny, but it was a wild story, uh, who was kidnapped <laughs> live on TV. Like he was just doing his live wow. TV sermon and they just rolled in there and just kidnapped him um, live. He did survive, they didn't pay the We'll do it live! <laughs> Bill that makes me worried about Sam Knight. Is Sam Knight okay? Do we still have uh, <laughs> Sam Knight with us? We're making sure that nothing bad has happened. He hasn't been kidnapped. He's oh, he's here. Survivor of Life, show. SK. Do you have any updates for us? Anything, uh, anything to report? Yeah, J.D. Vance is in the lead in Ohio, uh, I'm sorry to mm. say. Uh, the governor's race in Texas was called Lickety Split. Uh, guess who didn't win? No Beto. No Beto. Mm. No Beto O'Rourke win. Uh, maybe yeah, he'll yeah. run for something else uh, in the future. Uh, there are still more bars to be stood on <laughs> for Beto O'Rourke. That's right. And Tim Ryan, there is time for him to come back. Half the vote is in. Uh, and J.D. Vance is now ahead by uh, three percentage points. Uh Returns starting to come in in Wisconsin, where Mandela Barnes has a nice uh, 15 percentage point lead with uh, only 17 percent of the vote in. Uh, as, as you've seen in Ohio, that could easily shift more to the red as the night goes on. Uh, Chuck Grassley is down in Iowa, but again, very early still. Uh, I think a lot of people were surprised in the run up to the race that uh, Grassley, uh, his seat seemed so safe because he's like 91. Um, but anyway, yeah, well, we'll that's one to uh, keep an eye out for uh, as the night continues. Ted Budd what, ahead what by. Yeah, North Carolina. Yeah, Ted Budd's got a three percentage point lead now with two thirds of the vote in. Uh, Warnock still ahead in Georgia by, ooh, it's getting very close. It's uh, less than half a percentage point is what his lead is, 62% uh, of the vote in. The House races uh, still not looking good for the Virginia Democrats, although Spanberger is within like less than 5,000 votes behind with 15% of the vote left to go. There's still a path to victory for her, uh, Elaine Luria, she's down by 10 percentage points, but only two thirds of the vote in there. Um, you know, there were also a number of races that were called, uh, that were projected to be uh, uh, either toss up or Republicans would contest them. And it hasn't really panned out in Maryland's sixth congressional district, although. Uh, David Trone's lead is narrowing there to uh, seven percentage points, quarter of the vote in. Uh, there is also Myra is in Texas. She won a special election uh, in the run up to the midterm. And uh, she's a Republican. She flipped that seat in that special election a few months ago. And uh, now Democrats on uh, they're on route now to uh, taking it back, although half of the vote still left the count there in Myra Flores, but she is down by 10 percentage points. Uh, so that could be a flip for Democrats uh, if if that trend continues there. Mm -hmm. David yes, Trump, you mentioned America, one, bit one of America's richest men. He's, I, someone, I, I don't know if he's a billionaire, but he's up there. He's the owner of Total Wine, the... Giant wine stores, if you're curious, there's the owner of Total Wine. This is just to say that if there is going to be a red wave, uh, not evident yet. Mm -hmm. Not evident yet, but who well, knows? Well, some of the, the – some of the, some, it, yeah, I mean, it looked like Democrats were playing defense in a lot of these states early on, but the numbers are slowly shifting now with Ted Budd in the lead in North Carolina, the race in Georgia getting close. J.D. Vance pulling ahead. 
in yeah. Ohio. And again, all Republicans need to do is win two of those five toss ups and and control the Senate flips, uh, barring any sure, uh, sure. But, surprise. You know, there, there were races that were projected to be, um, you know, pretty comfortable for the Republicans. North Carolina's 13th yeah. district is the seat that uh, Ted Budd used to hold. And uh, the Democrat there uh, is ahead by seven percentage points with about two thirds of the vote in. So yeah. I don't know. But well, let's go to our... There's, there's the needle. Oh, right, we right. the needle. The needle is up. The needle is up right now. It says, it looks like Republicans, the needle has them taking control of the House, the House. barely, and it's still right down the middle in the Senate. Toss-up territory there. New York Times needle. We'll see if they can redeem themselves, redeem team over there on the election The, the needle is not a good world. predictor. It just kind of like shifts once facts come in that uh, <laughs> make it obvious. But, but it looks uh, cool. We just thought right. we'd check in on the needle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, shout out to whoever's, I guess, punching in numbers in the New York Times. I'm sure you're a fine person. Uh, as we move <laughs> forward here, we want to, <laughs> I don't know. I'm just assuming it's some intern or something. I don't know. Um, anyway, as we move on here, very, very honored to be joined on the show by public policy advocate, former Senate candidate herself, Seema Hernandez. Hi, how are you? Hi, Seema. Very good. Very good. Doing well. Very exciting. Yeah, this is a lot happening. We're really excited to have you two. You know, I don't know. I hate to even come out of the gate asking you what I feel is such a loaded question, and I hate the way it's framed, but I think it's going to be a big storyline coming out of this election. It was going in, and that is this assertion that Republicans are becoming the party of the Latino working class, that everything's shifting towards them, and that somehow the narrative of this night will somehow reflect that. I and mean, I'm just I'm wondering how you respond to that, because every time I hear it just repeated over and over again in every newspaper, on every TV show, always by someone white, uh, it, it almost feels like it's it's like a psyop. Like it's almost like they're trying to will it into existence, um, you know, as opposed to what's really there. But anyway, I don't want to editorialize too much. I'm curious your thoughts about that. And, and if anything that's happened tonight so far is, is influencing your views. Well, um... I gotta tell you that if there is a red wave and more Latinos turn out to vote for the Republican party, it is because the Democratic party has taken for granted the Latino vote has not reinvested um, in building electoral infrastructure across the state of Texas, specifically in Latino communities that are not just specific to the border, but they are across the entire state. Um, I'm also the campaign manager for Claudia Zapata. She's running in TX21 against Chip Roy. And even in that area, throughout the 10 counties of that district, 40% of the population in each district, in each county, is Latino. And there hasn't been any outreach because we are, as a party, uh, are simply forgetting about the populations that are there because we write it off as red, white, and rural. And that is just not the case. So if there is a wave and if Latinos are voting for Republicans, it's because Republicans have vastly, greatly invested money into that community. Sounds like a similar, we had our, yeah, we had our guest uh, Aaron from Georgia and there seems to be a similar dynamic where the electorate has presented Democrats with an opportunity and they appear to be squandering it. Absolutely. And we have, We've had years to build up electoral infrastructure, years to do deep canvassing efforts, years to to build up the reputation of what it is to be a um, a Democrat. And I know that's that's hard to take for a lot of people, but in a state like Texas, you are either Republican or Democrat, and if you're anywhere in between, you are not electorally engaged. And there is plenty of people that can literally, you know, just go out and register to vote. But if you don't have a candidate or a party that's actually showing up, knocking on your door, meeting your immediate needs, they're not going to vote for you. They're not going to be engaged. And frankly, a lot of people don't have time to be engaged because of the state of the economy. And if we are not addressing those material needs, people are not going to show up for the people that show up for them. You know, I think that's an important issue. And, and someone who I know you're familiar with, and I think speaks to some of these points that people were looking at, we mentioned him earlier in the, the Beto O'Rourke's campaign. And I, I mean, 
you know, of course, after the the tragedy of of, of Uvalde, I, I think it sort of there was sort of a new wind between people thinking, hey, he might be able to win, he might be able to ride this wave. But I, I mean, what do you think candidates like that are missing in terms of? Uh, I mean, is it their appeal? Is it the money that's against them? Is it the demographics? Because I feel that you know, in a lot of states like Texas, you always get this kind of hype around people that often fizzles out, you know, and the hype is obviously coming from the consultants in DC and in New York City. And I always wonder, you know, like what are what are the big things these people are missing? Well, one of the major things that they're missing is that they're not listening to the people on the ground. They're not listening to the organizers. They are squandering the money and paying DC consultants when they don't have their their finger on the pulse of what's going on on the ground. In terms of what happened in Uvalde, that was a massive um, tragedy, rude awakening. I've been there myself. I've spoken to the parents. I've spoken to community members there. It is a uh, an active crime scene and it is a memorial. The entire school, the entire community is, it's such a heartbreaking event to happen. And you would think that that would be a catalyst to motivate people to vote, um, to protect their, their loved ones from these open carry uh, law, law, per, what do you call it? Um, permitless, permitless carry laws in the state of Texas that allowed this person to purchase guns legally and commit a crime, commit a mass murder on a school campus. But even that wasn't enough for folks to come out and vote because we continuously, as as candidates, as voters, we continue to play into the gaslighting, political rhetoric that leads right into Republican talking points. And we as, as candidates, as activists, as organizers, we need resources to combat that kind of narrative and shift that conversation into something that is more policy-based, that is based in truth and statistics, rather than fear-mongering people into thinking that we're all about taking away people's right to own a gun, when really we're talking about gun safety and common sense law reform. We, we don't want to take people's guns. We don't want to put fear into people. We literally want to keep people safe to make sure that this doesn't happen to any more communities. Whether you're in Texas, whether you're in Florida, California, Michigan, it doesn't matter. These, these types of policies need to be discussed at a level that people can understand. That way they are not buying into the fear mongering rhetoric. In addition to the uh, failures of the police in Uvalde, you, we also saw the failure of Texas's energy grid uh, now multiple times over the last few years that have uh, res been responsible for the loss of life, the economic ruin of a lot of people. Uh, Texas, this state that insists on having its energy grid separate from the rest of the country and you know, now they deal with the consequences of it during climate change when there's too much demand for it and they can't uh, accommodate it. Are Were any of these issues major issues during the, the governor's race? Are there any issues in other uh, elections uh, going around Texas? Because it seems like that should be you know, managing your energy grid and ensuring people have electricity should be one of the top jobs of a, of a political party in power, and they can't even accomplish that. You bring up an excellent point. And really what the party has done is left it up to the candidates to campaign. And the people that I, that I heard discuss the, um, the energy grid itself and the climate crisis or the, the climate response were uh, the Lieutenant Governor candidate, Mike Collier, uh, Railroad Commissioner, Luke Warford, uh, Beto O'Rourke would discuss it several times, but it wasn't the galvanizing um, conversation that got people to really come out. Even though it's an it's a economic discussion, it's an economic issue because we lost people and our utility bills are higher there is a tax that we are now paying to maintain an infrastructure which we've been paying into for years and it's still failing for people like me that live alongside the petrochemical industry we are a fence line community our energy grid is tied into the petrochemicals petrochemical refineries as well so when these industries go offline it's because the energy grid has gone offline as well so it should have been 
a, a much bigger talking point driving home the conversation of the economy, of creating jobs, of creating stability and empowering low income communities across the board. But it didn't happen. And I would like to see more of that conversation happen, happening going forward, no matter who runs for office. And it should be a discussion for everyone to take place, to, to have this conversation, especially since it's a very local issue. It is a very state oriented issue. No one in Congress has direct power over the energy grid in the state of Texas. It is literally left up to the governor, lieutenant governor, and uh, railroad commissioners as well. But more importantly, the state ledge. If we don't flip the state ledge, we're going to be in the same situation, regardless of if Beto O'Rourke wins or Governor Greg Abbott. And based on the results, it doesn't look good. You know, it, it reminds me it, sort of another issue that, that you know, Texas in many ways is ground zero of, and that is voter suppression, is, is it feels that maybe I'm wrong about this and you correct me if you think I'm wrong, uh, you know, that there's still a, there's a huge amount of fear, like these these far right Republicans in the state of Texas, they seem to have these huge super majorities, total lockstep on everyone. But then they're going out of their way, way out of their way to make it as hard as they can for people to vote. And it just makes me think, well, they must be afraid of something because they can't be that popular if they're worried that people having 24 hour voting in Houston is going to get them out of here. Well, the, again, another excellent point, something that I've talked about for these six years, is that you see this massive wave of not just voter suppression, but taking people's rights away at a state level when you see that the demographics are changing, that more people are registering, and that the older generation is dying off and bringing a whole new electorate forward. That means that they see that their time in office is going to be over soon. And this is one of the only ways that they can control, maintain control of, of power at the state level. And if we do not have federal uniform voting laws to protect and expand our rights, this is going to continue to happen state by state. And Texas is always leading the way in voter suppression. Well, Seema, we really appreciate it. We're going to be watching Texas 21. I'll just say this because we'll go off before all the Texas results are in. Any other races you you want people to pay close attention to when they're watching what happens in your state? Well, in terms of the electorate in Texas, because we don't have infrastructure, electoral infrastructure investment from the party itself, we are probably going to lose a lot of seats that we thought we had secured. Um, TX34, for example, you just brought up, was flipped in a special election. And now it looks like it's going to be flipped back to Democrat. And they had the Democratic Party had this district for 40 years. What the hell happened? Now, why aren't we investing? Why aren't we making sure that we keep the blue districts blue, but also expand the electorate and investing in districts and candidates, maybe not specifically candidates, but investing in deep canvassing efforts prior to an election, at least eight months before an election starts, so that the groundswell is there, the, the information is completely perforated with policies that we want to see at the very localized level from the bottom to the top of the ticket. That's that's what I would like to see, because if we don't do that as a, as a party, as candidates, as activists, as organizers, we are never going to see an expansion of the electorate or people actually getting their rights back and telling people, you know, don't give up, vote, because it does matter. And also, Besides voting, organize, get involved with organizations that are doing this work, get involved in organizations that are doing the work on the environmental side of it, which is where I'm at with um, Progressive Coders Network. And I'm going to plug that away, shameless plug, uh, Progressive Coders Network. We are always working on open source technology to making sure that we empower the grassroots and working to make the environment a much better place to live in. Mm -hmm. Well, we so love a good so plug. Much. No, of course, important, important work. Very important work. As always, Seema Hernandez, thank you so much for joining us here on Election Night 2022. Thank you. Have a good night. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Seema. Yep. You know, Sam is... Well, we, uh, we're we almost to the end here, Eugene. We are almost to the end, uh, sir. And uh, the last time we almost came to an end of Election Night podcast, I think we were we were all... We were kind of dying because we couldn't believe what was happening. But, you know, one thing I'll say here as we come to a close that... You know, what Seema was saying made me think of is is everything she's saying is so obvious. Like, why aren't the Democrats doing more? 
the actual popular policies, actually trying to campaign. And to me, it feels like this is the core contradiction amongst Democrats is that, you know, if you're a Republican capitalist party, free market party, so you can kind of go as far right as you want, right? Like at the end of the day, the donors, even if maybe they don't like how you phrase it, they know they're going to be putting money in their pockets from your policies. But the Democrats also totally controlled by big money. Obviously, the further left you move, the more you're criticizing big money, capital, capitalism, the ruling class, however we want to put it. So it creates this existential crisis where the things that they could do to win become deeply anathema to the people who control the money, the consultants, the broader party infrastructure, because basically the capitalist system is working for them. And this is what is, you know, the gravy train that they're all going off. And it makes me feel like they're to some degree afraid of winning, not because they want to lose, but because they can see the most popular policies amongst working class people, younger people, the black, Latino and indigenous communities, you know, white working class people who make under $50,000, especially under $30,000 who tend to vote for Democrats, even though that's never talked about. Um, you know, they understand that if those people get what they want, quite frankly, the Nancy Pelosi's, the Chuck Schumer's, the media buyers, uh, and whoever else is behind it, their days are probably numbered and they have to work to prevent it. Yeah, and the consulting class that uh, gets its paycheck f through advising the Democratic Party gets paid whether they win or lose. Mm -hmm. And in a way, it's a giant racket that keeps going. And just the, the messaging around this party is so is just a mess where you have, you know, we didn't we didn't get too much into like war funding. We talked about it with Claudia a little bit. And there was the Congressional Progressive Caucus that released that letter and then immediately rescinded that letter talking about Ukraine and how we should keep an eye on a diplomatic solution to there. And one of the reasons that letter was rescinded is that it muddled the Democrats message heading into the midterms as the party that's unified uh to continue helping Ukraine. At the same time, you've got Joe Manchin walking around talking about how he wants to strike a grand bargain with Republicans to cut Medicare and Social Security. How is that not muddling the Democrats' message that the Republicans are the party that wants to cut Social Security, Medicare, we're the party that wants to cut it or that wants to keep it and preserve it? So, you, you know, you really can see the priorities in order with this party uh, where even the 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 the, the sancti you know the sanctified things like medicare and social security they can let that get cut but god forbid we should say anything that should harm our donors in the defense industry yeah. uh you got major problems um it is nearing 10 p.m let's bring on sam knight here for some last minute uh updates and we can give people uh what they a little some tips on what they should be looking at once we go off air, if they want to keep following the election coverage, mm -hmm. hopefully not on cable news. There's plenty of other independent content creators, I'm sure, who are streaming like we were, who can pick up the coverage after we leave. Yeah, I, I was just thinking back to when we were last uh, calling an election all together in 2016. And uh, if I recall correctly, the House was called for Republicans by like 8.15 that they would retain control of the house. Uh, it's two minutes until 10 o'clock. We really, we have no idea what's going on uh, in terms of a bigger picture. Dems are perform outperforming the expectations in some areas, uh, other areas, you know, underperforming. This is just to say it's going to be a long night. And if you were hoping to get your results tonight, uh, you're going to be disappointed take it easy, maybe go to sleep early. Uh, although if you want to stay up, uh, Nevada is definitely going to be uh, an important one with uh, mm -hmm. uh, Cortez Masto there trying to hold on to that seat for Democrats and uh, Republicans are feeling pretty good about their chances of taking it. Yeah, at 10 p.m., Iowa, Idaho, Montana, Nevada, Oregon, Utah, all those polls close. Uh, you can figure out the results coming in there, but not with us. No, not with us. Nevada definitely going to be an interesting one. Um, I believe the Republican Secretary of State candidate in Nevada, who is, you know, of course, an election denier, I believe I have this right. I think he said that he was not 100% sure that his own win in the primary was legitimate. So that's how deeply he's committed to the idea of Nevada elections. 
not being real. He's questioning his own win. So if he is to win tonight, could be interesting um, on a number of different uh, fronts. But, of course, Nevada probably going to be one of the big ones, as you pointed out very well, Sam. And I think there's going to be a lot of this. There's going to be lawsuits, undoubtedly, you know, I mean, in Pennsylvania, this issue brewing over whether or not the undated or improperly dated mail-in ballots will really be counted. Uh, people having to go in to fix the ballots and how that's all going to work out. Uh, so I, I have a feeling this might be a two or three day election kind of piece. Another sort of small thing, but might be interesting to see, um, Louisiana, which has a top two primary uh, so basically, who if no one gets 50% in this election, they'll have a runoff. Two Democrats, there's actually three, but two who are really vying. This guy, Luke Mixon, very kind of clean-cut white guy, kind of typical middle-of-the-road Democrat in the South. Gary Chambers, the other Democrat who's running on much more Bernie-style platform. He had a campaign ad where he was smoking weed, another one where he was burning a Confederate flag, um, really basically just saying, I'm going to leave it all on the table. So obviously he will not beat John Kennedy. Uh, that seems highly unlikely. But who emerges as the top Democrat there might be an interesting commentary on where the, the electorate is going, especially in a state like Louisiana. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think we're going to have to continue to talk, continue to rap. That's why there's means morning news. All right. So you can continue to get your morning news. That's why we're doing the freedom side here on breakthrough news and many other things that we continue to do. So I have to say, if you are watching wherever you may be watching, make sure that you are consistently watching, following, and donating to both these networks. There's amazing shows on all of them, great people who are working very hard, doing many people's different jobs, because ultimately this has to be done. I think maybe if we can frame anything, Sam Sachs, it's that the way these elections are messaged, the way they are discussed, the information that people are, are fed in order to shape their political views is deeply, deeply broken. So without the battle of ideas, if we can't take on these big capitalist media conglomerates, we can't succeed and we can't win anything. So I, I have to say I'm honored to be with you guys yet again. We're back together. Boys are back in town. Means Morning News, fantastic. Means TV, everything that happens there is fantastic. So it was really, really my pleasure, gents. Yeah, you, you might say we're the real troops here doing independent <laughs> media broadcasting on election night. <laughs> that's right. That's Salute right. Sam Knight. Go ahead. I was I was just gonna say Thank I'm you. gonna take I'm gonna take that to Denny's for my uh five percent veterans discount. Nice. Denny's <laughs> great uh, breakfast buffet. No, that's Sam Knight, nice. thanks for sticking around with us tonight, giving us the latest uh, on all these races. It was good to reunite the team that uh, was together in 2016. I also want to thank everyone behind the scenes, Max, Matt, Emily, Kai, uh, Teenage Stepdad, who made a lot of these graphics. Um, am I missing anyone, Eugene? Uh, the Jackie who's here for our social media from Breakthrough Jackie, News. Jackie, yes. I think that'll probably bring it full circle. But if we forgot you... We'll try to roll it on the credits or something. I don't know. And, of course, the viewers for tuning in and hanging out with us tonight. Thank You're you. You're the best. Thank you. We'll do it again in two years. We, we sure will. I'm Eugene per year for Sam Sachs for Breakthrough News and for Means Morning News. This was Election Night 2022.